All right, what was you saying, man? <laughs> yeah, so you said you in like, downtown LA. Right now, I'm downtown LA, man. That's the the headquarters for me right now. Uh, me and my fiance living down here, so having a good time. The last, you know, the last ten years, actually eleven years, I've been living in LA. So when I've been playing professionally in the summertime, I live in LA, but I've been living in Pasadena. Um, but now this last year, we we decided to come here to downtown. I got a nice little spot here, so. I'm loving the area here, and, and uh, I really like it here. So, cool. You look good, man. So let me give a, a oh. brief introduction to let people know who they um they're listening to. This Appreciate is Eric Rush. Eric is an old um I want to say what do they say? We're not old friends because we ain't really had we na- we didn't have time to really right. build that they, that type of relationship. I mean, but, um, but we more than, they would say acquaintances, but we more than that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric's somebody yeah. that I got really close to. Uh, a few years back, well, years back, like a decade back, and we was like yeah. kicking it for um a good period of time, man. And uh, yeah. I have him on here because I'm just amazed by what you've been doing. I, I just like to have people on that's been doing things with their life and that's been positive. You feel oh, me? Man. And um, that's dope. Yeah, man, you, you've been making uh, strides in your life, and you know, seeing how you develop character, how your character developed as well over time. So that's why I have hey, you on here, man. I appreciate that, man. Those are big words, man. And uh, yeah, I'll just add to that is we, uh, so I was introduced to you through my friend who I was kicking it with, Brian and, and uh, his family who in high school. So I was introduced to you. We actually went to different high schools. So that's why, yeah. we, you know, it was, it was cool to meet you. You was from a, a whole different city. You was from East Palo Alto, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we was from the different sides of the Bay, but then we got together and we just, we, you know, we were both athletes. You know, we we was about our you know we yeah. had the our ambition to get better and strive better, so we kind of connected on that. Yeah, which was super cool, man. We so clicked. it was also cool seeing your development, man. I didn't even know yeah. you were going to go. A lot of people say that. They was like, yeah, yeah, I get that a lot, man. People were like, damn, man, you went to. I thought you was just like some tough football dude. You feel me? I never saw you into like tech and you know right. doing the things you've been doing, talking what you've been talking about. That's just honestly, man. That's just maturation you feel me that's that's life man and some people you you know just like i do some people stop at certain stages and i'm mm. grateful that I've, I've had opportunities to keep growing i love that yeah and it's dope to see and like you said this is, this is what i really like is how people kind of unfortunately view you know they look at someone that is an athlete is from a certain area and they just think okay he's just he is what it is they don't know it's a deeper thing going on and you can be bigger than what just what people think you are. You know what I mean? So you kept growing and, and got into that technology space, which a lot of, to be real, we don't have a lot of brothers in that space, which is so cool to see you, you know, doing your thing with that and, and uh, being really a role model for everybody. So kudos to you. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You said you don't see a lot of brothers in tech. You know, the reason I, I named my, um, I actually have a company called Geek Mode, geekmode.tech. It's called Geek Mode School of React Native. And um, the reason I named it Geek Mode is because when I was playing sports, you know, I had a lot of su- support for sports. And then um, I was trying to play professionally and I had options, the opportunities to go play. I did arena for um, half a season with um, the Utah Blaze. And mm-hmm. then I was, um, I had the opportunity, I had to work out with the San Diego Chargers and to work out with the uh, Seattle Seahawks. They have these regional like um, combine events for people that are invited. So I went to a, I went to those and um I, I mean put it like this man at the I, I, I did really well at the Utah Blaze combine. I ran a four four seven, had mm-hmm. broad jump ten six, and then I had um I didn't tell my agent this, but before my NFL workouts, I had fell down the stairs and oh, dislocated boy. my shoulder. So Good. I didn't want <laughs> <laughs> I dislocated my, it was because Utah has black ice. It has snow. So I, I had oh. um, slipped on black ice as I was doing patrol because I did security at the time. Mm-hmm. And then I slipped, but I still went to my workouts and I did I did okay. And my agent was like, oh, well, do you want to try out um, Canadian League? And then at the time I was putting dollar, I was putting them dollars together and it just made more sense for me to, to go to school and then really focus on building my own business. So that's what I mm-hmm. chose to do, you know? Right, right. And um, the reason that I did name it Geek Mode is because when you come from the environment, like you come from like our area and you look like we do your brother or people only see you as a, um, an athlete, 
You feel me? Exactly. Exactly. And um, as soon as I started focusing on academics and focusing on tech, a lot of people, I lost a lot of support from the people in my community. And they was calling mm. me a geek. They was calling me a geek and trying me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to create this platform. I, w- I need to let people know that you can be athletic, you can be tough, and you can exactly. be intelligent. You don't have oh, to man. choose one way. You feel me? So that's why I named it Geek Mode. I love that, man. And you know what? That's super dope. And it's actually something that I, I really live by. It's like, because uh, I'm multicultural, multiracial. So, you know, I get a lot of uh, the same kind of, I, I don't want to say juxtapositions, but, you know, people look at you and think you're going to be a certain way, but you like, I have, I can be other things. I can do other things. I'm more than just what you want me to be. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it's so important for that. And I want people from our area, people that, you know, people of color, people that look like us to know you don't just have to be an athlete. You can be an athlete, which is great, but you need to use that platform, use what you learn from athletes, from athletics, mm. and do other things and bigger things into the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and that's what I'm actually working on now. Is like I'm tired of seeing really like basketball players, right? Former basketball players. They, they end up, and then what do they do? Especially overseas, happens. They, they finish their career, they come back home, and they're like, "What's the best? What's the easiest thing to do?" be a middle school teacher, be a middle school coach, right? Or or something like that. I'm like, now we can challenge ourselves. Learn what you, what I mean, apply what you learn as a professional athlete, which is, you know, determination, hard work, discipline, uh, all these things. And let's put it into the real world and, and be a role model for these people to see that you can use this and, and be successful in other areas, right? Yeah. yeah I so, feel uh, you, man. Um, I, he was talking about the work ethic part and, um, that was something that when I was playing football, because I actually played for the University of Utah, and um, yep. that was one of the things that I noticed just even in my adulthood now is like the, the advantage of playing a, a sport at a high level is that you learn discipline and you can right. apply that discipline to anything, you know. And um, I think a lot of people who are uh, just aspire to do anything or people who are, you know, we're talking about athletes specifically, a lot of them, they they built their whole um, their whole I want to say they build up their whole self to actually become the professional football player or a professional basketball player. And then when that's gone, they don't know what else to do after exactly. that. But they're yeah. not aware that they can use that same work ethic and apply it to anything else and, and defeat mo- and out and out compete most people in this country easily. Exactly. Cause most people don't have that type of work ethic, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to do now and I'm learning and, uh, you hit it right on the head, man is, a. Uh, is that like that work ethic is you got to take that and apply it, you know, the same way you did it athletics. Let's work on the, the study and let's work on furthering your education or, or putting more emails and more hours on the phone, whatever your job is, whatever you got to do, apply mm-hmm. that, you know? And so let's talk about, man, I want to talk about how was your experience at Utah, man? What was that like going from California to sunny old California, the Bay Area, well, you know, Bay Area is known in California as having a little bit of, a little bit colder sometimes in the, in the North Bay, but we was in, more in the South, which was warm. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of sun. And then yeah. going out to Utah with a whole different culture and then weather and stuff like that. What was that like for you, dog? Okay, before I get into it, can you hear me clear? And is my video coming in clear? I can hear you clear. Your video is clear. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, pixelation. I mean, not bad. It's not, you know, I can see you. Clearly. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I want to like slap this thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slap just to make sure everything comes in clear because sometimes you have to do that to make the audio cool. And the reason I asked you that is because your um your screen goes in and out. So you is everything oh, good no. on your end? Is, is no, that right? If it's recording well on your end, we don't have to worry about it. Okay, yeah, everything's good on my end. Okay, cool. So how was my experience in Utah? Are you saying? Yeah, so right. how was that like going from, from the Bay, you know, and then with our culture there, especially as a high schooler, you know, we had different mentalities and stuff and then going straight straight to Utah. Right? Did you get a full scholarship right away? Huh? Did you get a full scholarship right away? No, Utah? I walked on. I walked on to the University of Utah. Um, I walked on and I came to the University of Utah. I could have went to like a 1AA and I chose not to because the, my cousin was playing football for the University of Utah at the time. And they had just beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Mm-hmm. So because they just beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl and I had a relative on the football team, I was like, let me just go there and I can hang out and get with my cousin. And um, Utah, honestly, man, uh, 
I can never really say anything bad about Utah because of my evolution since being in Utah. You know, I'll, I'll tell relatives, like, I'll try to get my brothers or somebody to come out here and say, hey, you know, come to Utah. But then it's like, you know, they'll say it's not that many black people in Utah. That's a good point. It's not that many black people in Utah. And then um, they're just not sure what kind of opportunities they'll have. But I'll say, look, man, if you like any of my evolution, you like any of the things that I'm doing, you know, there's also other brothers here and they, they're doing things at a higher level than I'm doing here. And it's because we've been in this environment. We had an opportunity to um, just grow in other areas. Mm. Coming from California, being in East Palo Alto, you know, that East Palo Alto, the early 90s was murder capital at one point in time. And a lot of people who, you're not aware of it, but when you come from those type of environments, is that you you become engineered or engineered or governed to like respond to negative, like, um, I want to say just like negative experiences. Like in East Palo Alto, I always felt like I had to be ready in case somebody tried me or I had to like um, get somebody before they got me. And I was quick to explode on people. You know, I was a little bit harder. But when I came into Utah, I realized that um, people didn't come at me the same way. And then also the cops didn't bother me in um, Utah. So because of that, I really, a lot of that anxiety, which I, did, I wouldn't have called it anxiety before, but a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the worry, a lot of that type of fear kind of just um, it disintegrated over time. Now, because my mind wasn't focused on something so negative, there were um, there was space for me to grow in other areas. Like I can play classical guitar now to classical guitar in college. Um, I'm coding coding. I didn't go to school for coding. I was um, when I was playing football, I just was bored and um, I bought a macbook on a, with a credit card and i just started learning how to code it was a hobby of mine so i you know, a lot of, a lot of people didn't even know i did that as a hobby for fun and i had no idea that i was developing skills to become a software engineer i was just coding because the smartphones that just came out and i was just like what is this all about so i was like let me just you know let me see what this let me try to play around with this man. so that's how that happened man but being in utah has definitely helped me grow in a positive um a positive light as far as like the people in Utah, I couldn't tell you much because I wasn't aware of this when I first came to Utah. I usually hung out with people who are from different countries mm-hmm. or people who are athletes. But in Utah, you know, it's um, it is in America. It is in the United States of America. So there's a racial factor. But even more than that, there's a um, religious factor, which is unique. So in Utah, if you're not Mormon, you know, historically, if you're not Mormon, they kind of ask, um, outcast you. Mm-hmm. So when I came here, mm-hmm. there was a lot of people who was like, I guess they was um, basically kicked out of the group because they weren't Mormon. So there was a lot of people just hating on Mormons. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I heard it from enough people to know that, OK, there's a level of truth of it. So for mm-hmm. me to talk about like the Mormons, I really don't know. The Mormons, they kind of do stick around the Mormons. And from what I can see. The Mormons do a great job of taking care of the state. Utah is a clean state. It's not a police state. I can go for a run. I can go for a drive. I don't have to worry about nobody bothering me. So those, mm-hmm. those are the things that matter to me the most. Right. But people who aren't from here and they don't, they have a hard time socializing, especially if you're young, because now you, you know, you kind of use you're not used to social getting to know people outside of a smartphone. But a lot of people, if you have if you struggle with that, a lot of people they have a hard time building relationships in Utah because of um just because of how the culture is. I don't mm-hmm. know how it is in California. I mean, is Cali- I mean, we grew up without smartphones. Right. So this could be something that's going around the whole country, people not knowing how to talk to people no more. E- exactly. But, exactly. But is that happening in Cali too? Well, I mean, I, I couldn't really speak on that because I, I'm kind of like you. I, I enjoy, you know, speaking with people from other cultures, other ethnicities, other even ways of life. So I really don't have, I, I don't have an issue, you know, with, uh, okay. with, in, you know, on that uh, aspect. So, um, but, but I talked to uh, one of my friends is an educator and he was telling me like what he notices is in the youth, uh, right now is that they're having the issue, you know, they're, they're dealing with the phones all day, every day. They're dealing with, uh, actually a lot of like, you know, mental health issues as far as, you know, anxieties and depression as a result of, you know, not probably seeing things online that, you know, aren't necessarily real or trying to live up to things or, you know, or getting, you know, also bullied and stuff like that. Um, so that affects how they, how they speak to one another, you know, at the youth level. 
So that's a mm -hmm. real thing that's going on. You know, I've heard of that. Um, I had a mentor in California named Kim Oden. She was on the United States Olympic uh, volleyball team for like in the early 90s, late 80s. She played at Stanford. She was she was a stud, but mm -hmm. she was working at the same high school that M Michael Jackson's kids went to and Kim Kardashian went to some school in L.A. So it might um, be in Calabasas, probably. Possibly. I, yeah. I wouldn't know. But she she was telling me about this area, but she was saying like a lot of because uh, she likes she does like on um, these programs for like younger black students. And she was saying like these kids ain't like how you how you was when you was young. She said a lot of these kids have uh, they have which is what you said. They have like anxiety issues or insecurity issues. It's, and it's mm -hmm. not just because of they don't have people that look like them. It's because of like what you just said, social media. They don't know their world exists in social media. Exactly. So if they not, they not creating these new video memes that goes around or if they're not looking a certain way. And, you know, I, yeah. I, you know what I noticed, even with like the women on um, social media, regardless of what race they are, they all kind of, they're morphing the same, whether it's black, white, Asian, oh, Latina, yeah. like the hair color, the poses, the nose, the lips. It's like, everybody's trying to, you know, compete and look the same way. They're not trying to be unique. Yeah, with the new, with the advent of the BBL now, now everybody's looking the same for real. They got What's the, same the BBL? Person. The BBL is a the Brazilian butt lift. <laughs> <laughs> you never heard of that? No, uh, I have heard of it. I just said yeah. that was BBL. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the word. That's the word for it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. You know everything about it, but I know that everybody's got the shape. Like you said, they all getting the same doctors. Basically, they want, they all looking the same. So. It's crazy, man. I it's, like, it's, it's crazy what technology is uh, just doing to the world. It's it's too physical. I mean, I'm keep real. I like the look, but yeah. as you get older, you realize that you know the look ain't gonna keep you around. You gotta like exactly. It's, it's yeah. same as men. You know, regardless of how good you think you look or what you got going on, you realize there's other areas of your character you got to work on too. So you feel it, me? I mean, it. you only learn by living. You don't learn by looking at social media. Exactly right, and there's a difference. So I always say, like, uh, that's why. I, honestly, that's probably why people love sports. Like, sports is uh, as real as it gets. You know, what I mean, you can look good on. Uh, I, I always say my because I what I do a lot now is I do a lot of mentoring to young kids or, or high school level kids, elite athletes, college, and even now young pros. And that's actually one of my uh, businesses that I set up. It's called uh, Initial Consulting, and I work with. Uh, like I said, overseas uh, professional basketball players, uh, college athletes at USC here, um, Pepperdine, uh, Arizona, and a couple of Pac-12 uh, teams and some uh, Big East teams. Uh, and so when I'm working on the high school level, I tell them, you know, I come and I say, look, nowadays kids are posting their little Instagram story that, hey, I'm in the gym. <laughs> hey, I, I was in the gym. I got a, I took my shot. I'm in the weight room, right? What they're really mm -hmm. doing, most of them, they're taking that little one second photo they put the phone down or they texting the whole time in the gym and then they go home and they think they did something so mm -hmm. what happens is when they show up to the game they meet a real real one that was actually putting in the work that wasn't really showing all that stuff you know he wasn't faking it so when that when you meet the real in the sports it shows you can't fake it <laughs> at a certain point right it's that you either got it or you don't and mm -hmm. my whole career was like and my whole life I was like that you know i was thinking i didn't want to just look good or, you know, it would be something that was not real. I wanted to be the real thing. When I showed up, it was like, okay, I put in the work. You know, I had the confidence. I had the real confidence. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. I remember you working out when we was younger. I remember, <laughs> you know, I remember us playing ball. We had like a little duck contest or something. <laughs> I remember oh, it was at right. Brian House or somebody else. We had some kind of contest. But yeah, you was always, you was always committed. You know, right. um, I wanted to elaborate on commitment, man. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people... Cause I just started getting social media about three years ago and I, I got it because I always intended to use it for um, my business. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been a little bit more active recently. And now because I've been more active, people get to see a lot of what I do and they get to see like my life, you know, see where I travel and things like that. And um, the thing that bothered me really about social media was that, well, well the response to my social media thing that bothered me was, a lot of people think that this was handed for me to me or it was easy because I'll get people talking about what they're doing, but you never like see the results of what you're doing. Cause I mean, I, 
I, I tell them like, hey man, you know, I, I I didn't always learn, know how to code, or I couldn't always do the mm. things that I do. It's because I put in the time to do it. You mm-hmm. know, I didn't know how to put together a podcast. I put the time and just put, put together a podcast. I, didn't, I wasn't always, I was always willing to fight, but I wasn't always a good fighter. You feel me? I mean, I just went to the gym and I got my ass kicked too. I learned, I learned <laughs> how to like, <laughs> I learned something, you feel me? But yeah. people, there's so many people comparing themselves to others through social media and they realize they, I don't know if they think they think things happen faster than it's supposed to happen, but you know, they don't, they like the commitment part. That is exactly you hit it right on the head. And so you said you started coding, right? Uh, when you got into college or in high school? It was toward, no, no, no. It was towards the end of uh, my college career. Oh, towards the end of it. And then, so yes. how long did it take you for you to get, uh, you know, really, really comfortable with it or, or start making business out of it? It took me a minute. And the reason it took me a minute is because I didn't have any mentorship Mm -hmm. and the internet, the internet wasn't what it is today. Like in college, in college, the way they teach you how they teach um, computer science, the way they teach you how to code or engineer is that they teach you a a language that you do not use in the everyday world. They teach you in Java. And the reason they'll grab a language like Java and not one of the more popular languages is because Java is more stagnant. So they'll teach you how to, um, I want to say, make uh, do like a loop or like make calculations or whatnot, but they don't actually teach you how to build a web application or mobile application. When we got in college, mobile application came out after college. It came out like shortly after, like smartphones. Mm-hmm. So colleges don't teach you how to build an app that you would use on a smartphone. They don't have that in the curriculum. Right. So when I was So when I was learning it, I had to like go on the internet and, you know, buy books and those books would be outdated within about five months because technology at that time was just evolving so fast. It's still evolving. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a little bit more stable, but it's consistently changing. So when we first got into it, it was just like, I would learn something then I have to learn something else. And then, um, it took me, I want to say about two years to put everything together. But, um, I would say, to somebody that's trying to get into it now, there's a lot more resources available now, like, you know, YouTube, and then they have um, more different types of tutorials, way different courses. It's a lot, the the language is a lot more sophisticated. There's somebody to talk to now. So Mm -hmm. it's a lot easier for people to get into it and probably get a career within like six months as a software engineer. Mm. They can get into it, but so you said it's continuously evolving. So they got, it's a, it's something that you have to continuously learn, right? I mean, yeah, when people, yes, when people hire you, they actually ask you, are you committed to le- to your learning? And the reason they ask you that is because, yes, tools and technologies, it's always involving. And then also the best practices are always changing. Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't take a tool out of the box and then expect it to do everything you need it to do. Sometimes you have to use tools outside of the tool you're using. It's called dependencies. Sometimes you mm-hmm. need to use a dependency um, to actually make your application uh, work the way you want it to work. Um, keyword dependency. Your application is dependent on this tool. So mm. a lot of those times as a, as a software engineer, you have to decide on, is this a tool that you can build your, your own or do you need to use a dependency to actually maintain that tool? And uh, the reason you need to, the reason you need to have that conversation is because sometimes you'll use a tool that another developer created, but it's not maintained. So you're going to be maintaining your own code base and somebody else's code base. You don't right. want to do that. You don't want to do that for a company that you're working on, working with and that trusted you to build this feature. So there are, before you even use a dependency, you should actually do research on the dependency, see if it's been updated like monthly and then just just to see how well the documentation is because um you can get code from anywhere man and it's not necessarily the best thing to do right you feel me it's yeah. like it's like That's hiring somebody man it's like hiring somebody you worked with people before and i'm sure you, you've had people disappoint you and those who have not disappointed you and what it comes down to is that you only get better at um hiring people managing or using different dependencies off of your experience. So you you gain, you gain the experience and knowledge and you can tell basically based off of what you see or what's presented to you, if this is something that you should use within your business. Mm. That makes yep. sense. That makes total sense. And I love that. It's it's uh, very similar to what, uh, so also I didn't tell you, so what I'm working with, not only do I work with, uh, 
you know, the, the athletes, but I, I'm, I set up a firm that's called the Nitzio Consulting, and we have a business side to it too. So we consult with, uh, we're getting into consultants with some businesses and some executives. And actually some of the, uh, the conversations was just that they talked to me and my, and my partner about, you know, how do they hire for, you know, not how, but, you know, who did, what's kind of to talk about what they look for when they're hiring for culture for, you know, because uh, they, they don't want to make the wrong hire, right? So what can you look for other than if everybody has the same skills, there's character traits or things that you can see that, you know, that we kind yeah. of walk them through and it helps them make the right decision that's going to help their company, right, for the future. Yeah. Because, you know, you, like you say, you make the wrong hire, <laughs> it, it, it can take you down for, faster than, uh, you know, than you like. It can take you down. They can take, try to, I've had people, man, I had a, a nonprofit I started and I had this guy who looked good on paper. He didn't have the experience, but because he dressed well, he spoke well, I was manipulated and mm. I manipulated myself because if I would have never had this, this, uh, this, this, this belief of who he was, he would have never had the space to actually get as far as he did. Mm-hmm. But you only, you honestly only get better at choosing by making these mistakes. Yeah, you know? right. And it's, Experience it's, and it's, is and a it's, good, great teacher. <laughs> yes, and it's not the it's not the other person's fault because in life you always going to encounter these type of people, and it's your it's your job to actually be able to decipher between somebody that's good for you and somebody that's not good for you. That's you know, right. and I and I and I completely understand why they asked you. How do we make a good hire? Because it's it's fear. They don't want to make a mistake. But in making money, making business, you have to be willing to make those short time losses to actually uh, make some wins. That just yeah. this is how it is. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, there's a brother that um, I'm glad we talked about this. This is a guy I know that actually has a pretty good business, and he's afraid to work with brothers, right? And mm. um, he's afraid to work with brothers and he's a brother and he's afraid to work with brothers because, um, well, he, he helped out a brother and then the dude screwed him over. And basically he, he tried to punch him in public at like this big fancy gathering. right? Mm. <laughs> and it was one of, it was, it was a, it was a, one, a, a beautiful gathering. You had to wear suits and everything. Yeah. And he had some really powerful people in um, Utah's there. And the guy, was feeling some type of way he got in his head and it's like like just how we're talking imagine it's talking where we're talking and the guy just tries to punch him right mid conversation <laughs> so dude so dude just moved oh <laughs> hit him God. with a body shot but he didn't want to knock him out because he cared about him so much right he just was oh. so hurt that this was happening and he was trying to help this dude but um he was talking we were talking about it and i laugh about it every time and i tell him like man that person never liked you bro I was right. like, he never liked you. He, you just didn't see it because you wanted to see something else. Yeah, exactly. And um, he, 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 he let me know his fear around hiring brothers. And I was just like, man, you know, check this out, dude. I was like, I promise you. I was like, how many white men do you know? I was like, how many white men in this country do you know that own businesses? I said, I promise you that these white dudes have been screwed over by other white men. Yeah. I promise you. But they they never let that prevent them from actually helping other men that look like them. You know what I'm saying? Because at the right. end of the day, I was like, at the end of the day, it helps the community grow. You know, Mormons help Mormons and whatnot. You know, I was telling yeah. like, man, you know, that's I was like, you know, that that's just a lesson for you. That's not a, a racial lesson to tell you how a group of people is. I was like, you can still work with people. And at the end of the day, if somebody does hurt you or screw you, you have to have a long term vision. You're not always going to be in a position you're at. If somebody from your community that you do business with, you know, he 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 takes a little bit more extra off the plate and still uses that money in the community, it's still in your community. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you have to really, you really have to, you have to just have a long term thought around who you exactly. hire, basically, right. man. It's a bigger <laughs> it's goal. A, so, yeah, that's the that's a exactly. Funny story. This, but uh, yeah, and and it's interesting, man. And that's and it, we can get deep into this. I'm not going to go too deep, but it's a it is a deeper problem within you know, what, from what I have studied within that, you know, the color community and black community in general is that sometimes, you know, like you said, we'll, we'll, you hate, it, we'll hate on, we'll hate on each other. Like, you know what I mean? Like not, not hate, but like you said, he, he feels a certain way because of one person did something. But as we know, yeah. one person doesn't represent everybody. Right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, and like you said, you got to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, oh, okay, how did I make that mistake? Like and like you said, he there was I guarantee that guy gave him a couple. Uh, sorry, something popped up. 
he gave him a, he he showed him a window a couple of times of who he really was. He he just didn't see it. You know what I mean? Definitely. So, yeah, you got to. When those situations happen with me, I always look at myself first, and I don't blame a whole gen, a group of people. <laughs> you know, I look at myself. How could I get better? How, what did I miss? What did I do? Okay, how can I make that? Uh, you know, how can I learn from that? And then what I do with these type of things is I try to get like I try to get deep dive into the who that person is. You know, who's around that person, uh, the character mm-hmm. of the person. You know what I mean? And, Wisdom. And then, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You, you grew up. You, I had the same thing. You had to really, your parents, you've always, well, I used to hear this when I was growing up, and I used to see it in TV shows. It was like, oh, the parents wouldn't let their kid hang out with other kids. But I was thinking, like, what does that have to do with that? I was like, y'all y'all don't know what y'all talking about. We just right. hanging out. We friends. But there's a lot of truth to that as you get older. Birds of a feather flock together. That's 1,000% true. You really got to. You got to look at a person's social circle. Right. So before we move on and start uh, moving to your, your basketball career, you mentioned also that, um, and don't be afraid. I mean, I want, I, don't be afraid to talk about like black issues or something like that. It, I mean, honestly, there's, I feel like on the internet, a lot of people are, are cautious about talking about this stuff. You know, right. you can talk about women issues or gay issues. But people, I want people who look like us to really learn, like, hey, man, you, you don't have to live your life one way. You, you right. know what I'm saying? There's a lot of different avenues you can go through. And um, one thing you mentioned, you said there's a lot of brothers. There's not that many people that look like us in tech. You know, in school, there's a lot of Chinese people in college, right? And a lot of them are in tech. But what I noticed just being an engineer myself is that there's not a lot of Chinese people at these tech companies I work for, like a Walmart, General Motors, um, a Discover card, or really many of them, man. I worked for a few companies, and there was probably about two Chinese people in total, mm. probably two Asian people in total. And a lot of it, those people, they go back to um, their country. They get their education in America, mm-hmm. and then they'll go to their country and help China grow or something like that. Yeah. And the point I'm trying to make, I've worked with a lot of black engineers, you know, way more than I expected, to be honest, if I'm, if I'm keeping it real. Mm-hmm. So it let, it let me know that they're there, they're just invisible. Like our culture, we don't focus on the um, intelligent black men anymore. You mm. know, if you look at the images of a black man from the 70s to like the, the 40s, education was like the primary. You know what I'm saying? You can see the way we dressed. You can see the way we spoke to each other. It was just different. Mm-hmm. And now it seems like that man has been forgotten. So there, there's there's a lot of professionals. It's just there's no there's no platform for them to have these types of conversations and right. for them to really, um, really connect with other people like them. Right. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that it, out. There. That, that, that's interesting. But also I would imagine that the nature of the the job itself is kind of behind the scenes, right? Because kind of out the way a little bit, uh, making things yes. happen kind of behind the scenes, but we don't, like you said, there's no platform to really, no, we're not putting that in the media. Like this is what successful really exactly. is. You know, this is. You know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. They um, they really. I mean, well, for for our image is mostly athletes and musicians. Well, af- athletes, musicians, you know, actors, something right. entertaining, entertainment. But honestly, just as of lately, I want to say in our culture, we haven't really been there. We really don't put intelligent, strong men in general on TV anymore. I want to mm. say. It's more. And, and whose fault do you think that is? Do you think there's an agenda there, or? I, de- I definitely think there's an agenda because there's no one way for anybody, whether you're a man or woman or anything else. I think that um, there's a uh, there's definitely some kind of force or some kind of agenda to actually keep men in a more uneducated or more like boyish type of uh, persona. Mm-hmm. I always put it like that because uh, I feel like in America, if you're if you're a serious man, if you carry yourself in a serious way, um, people question you about it. They they will ask you why you're serious. They'll tell you you need to lighten up. Mm-hmm. There's basically there's an incentive to keep you in a more adolescent uh, mindset. I was in Korea. I want to say about a month ago now, and I was uh, visiting a good friend of mine from college, and I mentioned to him that in Korea. The people here are very polite, really respectful, but they're also really serious. When you walk and by them, you don't see people having small talk or people being silly, you know. And um, in America, 
people expect you to be silly on some level. They they expect you to smile all the time or, you know, have this like pointless conversation, but you don't, you don't have that in uh, Korea. And then it's, it's funny, right when I flew from South Korea to San Francisco, I was getting on the plane to go to, from San Francisco to Utah. This guy, I had my hand on the seat as I was just walking by. And this guy said, it's like, hey, man, wow, your hand is as big as my hand. And then just starts doing goofy shit and starts laughing. I look at his, <laughs> and I look at his girl and I'm just like, what the hell? And she what looks at me just world? like, but that's our culture. I think there's, I think there's definitely something going on where it's preventing man from like carrying himself in a more serious manner, you know, yeah. talking with your chest out, dressing like a man. You know, I think there is, there's something going on there. Yeah. Man. It's funny that you say dressing like a man. <laughs> So one of the things that I do when I talk to these, uh, especially like the high, the high school academy that I work with, uh, and, you know, I'll do some condi- uh, individual workouts and stuff. And at the end of it, you know, these high school kids got hormones going, you know, they smelling this and that. I tell them, hey, you guys got, you know, you're getting ready to go to class after this workout. Make sure you <laughs> go wash your ass, <laughs> put your clothes on, get dressed good, nice, and put on some good smell, look good, because you're representing yourself. I hear you represent as an athlete, people are looking up to you, a role model. And as a man, like you need to be the example, right? So it's important to look good, uh, smell good, you know, those little things like carry yourself in a, in a well-respected way, because it's, when people see that you respect yourself, they're going to give you respect. And then, you know, vice versa, you give respect and Hey, you're a role model, you know, it changes the way you think too. Oh, it changes Absolutely. the way you think. Clothes, clothes carry energy. And if you, um, just like how you, if you surround yourself around the right people, if you dress the way that, um, I mean, if you just dress in a real presentable, a presentable professional way, you'll carry yourself in a lot more serious, a serious manner. Yeah. All right. So I want to go into your uh, athletic career, man. Tell me about, like, why did you choose, what was it, University of Idaho? My bad, man. That's I my, to look that's up Brian. Your that was Brian. Yeah, no. I was Brian, Brian was Idaho. You Montana. You was Montana, Montana State. Montana State University. That's right. So <laughs> it's actually crazy, man. You know, I grew up in the, uh, you know, we grew up in the South Bay. Uh, but so my whole life, I was a military kid. You know, I was born in Mississippi. I, I lived there for like three years and I moved to South Carolina. And then we moved to Southern California here. Then I moved to the Bay. So I was always moving around as a kid. Okay. And what happens is, is in basketball, usually you start young. You start on the circuit, AAU. So colleges have an idea of who you are while you're young, 10, 14, whatever high school they know. I wasn't in those things. I was just living life, just, you know, being a kid and playing basketball, of course. But, you know, I didn't. I was on a military base in, in certain places. And then when I came out of California, I was at just uh, regular high schools and stuff. And I didn't know anything about, you know, the circuits of having to show yourself. And so I wasn't a highly uh, um, recruited player. You know, I was just kind of under the radar. And I was always talented and stuff. But just nobody really knew about me on the bigger uh, scale. So I went under the radar and had uh, finished up my career in, uh, in, in Milpitas High School. And I didn't get any scholarship offers. I was sitting there in the springtime when everybody's signing. You know, they sign in, you know, midseason in the springtime. And I'm sitting there with like nobody. I'm like, what am I gonna do with my life? <laughs> nobody wants me. You know, what am I gonna do? I have to go to JUCO. I don't. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, finally, I went to uh, got on with the AAU team, went out to Vegas, and I had you know a tournament. And then Montana State saw me right away. They're like, oh, you know, we, we want you. So they started recruiting me. Took me on a visit. I went out there and I saw just like how you said in Utah. I, I saw the mountains. I saw you know lakes and fresh air. I was like, whoa. It's actually reminding me uh, of Sweden because I'm half Swedish. You know, my mom's from Sweden. So mm-hmm. uh, growing up, I was actually growing up in the States. But then in the summertime, my mom would send me to Sweden by myself. I live out there with my grandparents. I had a great life with the mountains and lakes out there. And I come back in a little house in, in the States. So it was a crazy little culture shift. Anyway, so when I saw Montana, it reminded me of Sweden. I was like, oh, this is dope. I want to come here. You know, like this feels like something that I'm, I'm familiar with. And the coaching staff, the coaching staff was rocking with me. So uh, they ended up giving me the scholarship offer and I took it and then uh, went there. And I guess they say, I don't say the rest is history, but that's what happened. <laughs> What's your measurables, man? Okay. I know you're taller than me. What are you, 6'6"? Six, six? I'm 6'6", six, six, yeah. Now, okay. you know, I play around 215. 
I, and I got, I got, I got to keep my weight down because I, I, I really put on, I put on like a lot of muscle easily, just because of my genetics. So I got to like really focus yeah. on trying to slim down for basketball. You know, you yeah. got to be light. You like me then, man, because uh, I don't know if you remember, I always had bounce. Yeah. I, always been, I mean, I've always been built powerful, but um, playing football, yeah, I man, I, I feel like I can put on, if I, I can go on a vegetarian diet and still put on muscle at the end of the year. Isn't that crazy? So, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, I'm the same way as you. I had to drop, I'm 198 now. When I finished playing football, I was 243. My goodness. And th- and then when I first started boxing, I was like 230. And I just got down to like 198. And I've been getting down pretty much starving myself, to be honest. I mean, I try not to eat <laughs> at the five o'clock, to. drink gallons of water. Yeah. <laughs> but so where do you feel? Where do you, where is your weight? Where do you feel the most healthy? Like, oh, man, that's a hard thing to answer, man. Honestly, that's so hard for me to answer because right now, um, Put like this, I, when I lost 50 pounds, I lost 50 pounds in two months. So I did it in an unhealthy way. Mm-hmm. And it definitely, it, it affected me when I was in the ring. But um, your body adapts to um, changes over time. You know, so whatever your eating regimen is or whatever, like if you do have to cut weight and stay at a certain weight, if you get a, if you can find a, um, a eating schedule that works for you mm-hmm. and uh over time, after like over a year or so, your body will adapt to just eating that that amount of weight, and you'll lose, and you'll keep that weight down. Yeah. So exactly. then, so ultimately, so ultimately, being lighter, I want to say it is healthier for me in the long run because I can move. Like I mean, I was telling somebody, I was like, man, I'm moving like I was like 19 or 18 years old now. I can move a lot better. Yeah. But the transition from me being big D to little D. That was what was hard because I was connected to like the lifestyle of like the bigger version of myself. You right. Know? Yeah. Especially, so, so I think what? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say just you know when you're bigger, your 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 hunger, like your body adapts, like you need that food. So exactly. You know when you go exactly. down, that that that's fighting against that hunger is so tough. <laughs> like you said, starving yourself is basically how it feels. It's a it's a spiritual battle, man. Mm-hmm. You know. um, you just got to get tired. You got to get tired of being whoever you was at one point. Cause I've tried cutting weight years before and I didn't cut my weight, but then something happened and I was like, I'm not doing this no more. Mm. You feel me? I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to look like this no more. And I was like, you know, I need to change it. So I just, I, I stuck to it. Even when I was hungry, my mind was so disciplined on just, you know, cutting. I just didn't let it, I didn't let it phase me. And then over time, I was able to survive on way less. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like my mind, it's like my body gave up trying to fight me. It was like, okay, if you really want to do this, we're going to help you do it. Exactly. So, so, so from what I understand, I think like actually what happens is like the body and the stomach actually eventually kind of shrink. Like, so it gets, you don't need it. It's not as big as before. So you don't need all that food, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what did you fight at? What weight did you fight? Um, when I was, cause uh, in boxing, amateur boxing, you have, um, super heavyweight, you have heavyweight and light heavyweight, 200 pounds and up is super heavyweight. So you can be fighting anybody from 210 to 240 to 280. And, up. and then, um, if you're fighting heavyweight, heavyweight is, I want to say 199 to about 185. And then after that, after 185 is, is light heavy. Mm-hmm. So, for me, I'm fighting at heavyweight now, and um, you still fight. There's pro. You still fight. Yes, yes, yes. I still do amateur boxing. Okay. So the um, I still I have some like highlights. If you see on Instagram, they have like these little, I don't know, right under your description, they have like these little memories you can keep. Oh yeah, yeah. And then one of them is boxing. So I have like some of my highlights on there. I'm gonna go check that but, out. Uh, I'm gonna check those out. Yeah. So. The biggest difference when I was fighting heavyweight, heavyweight was actually easier because heavyweights don't move a lot. The biggest fear of fighting heavyweights is that it's just big dudes. But once you get over that mental um, aspect of it, it's a lot easier because the punches don't come as fast, they don't come as often, and people are getting tired. Mm-hmm. But when you start, when you go down in weight, that's when boxing, like you really have to be technically sound. Because a super heavyweight, you're going to get more. I mean, at light at, at heavyweight, you're going to get more people who also punch hard, and they can move, and they can like you know they're quicker or whatnot. Right. So you have to you have to learn how to really move and read punches and do all that. Mm-hmm. And it, and then lo- the the smaller you get, the harder it gets. 
you know, the only reason people like heavier fighters because you get more knockouts. Uh, the power. I was going to ask you, so yeah. like, so when you're a heavyweight, like you said, you can see them, you know, the, the hit, the, the punch is coming, but when they hit you, what is, is it, you feel it a lot more than, than the, the, you know, light, lighter weights or. Yeah. Cause as you're saying, I'm like, think I'm like thinking of it. Right. So I'm thinking of getting punched <laughs> by somebody. And, uh, yes, man. I remember I was, uh, I was winning this fight. I actually won this fight. And, um, dude was just he was way bigger than me but he was afraid of me i had came into the fight and i hit him real hard with a um a two that's like the straight right Mm -hmm. i hit him real hard and then it was one time where he threw a jab and i ducked under his jab and came over to hit him so he just was scared but if he if he didn't let it phase him he could have beat me Mm. but he just he got in his head but um i remember when i had him against the ropes and i was just like welling on him he hit me like well one punch he hit me just like like and it, it barely hit me, and I remember I was like, "Oh shit!" And it made me back up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> it made me back up, and then I came back in. Wow. So yeah, definitely, man. Those those uh those punches, those punches definitely hurt. That's why you need to learn how to roll with punches. Right. You need to know how to see a punch coming and go with it. And I didn't know how to do that at that time. <laughs> man, I'll tell you what though, I got so much respect. Anybody that gets in that ring, you know, that takes a different type of level of uh, mentality. And, and also, like with fighting, is uh, I, I I actually use that. So during my career, like especially during my prime, I would study. I would study like and then watch everything. Obviously, the great fighters, but I would watch, you know, you know, documentaries and behind the scenes stuff of uh, of these fighters to get their mentality, to get the you know the spirit. And I would use that for my uh, yeah. you know, motivation for training and stuff and, and mentality. I'll bring it on the court, you know, because if you yeah. there's nothing like a fighter's mentality, man. Because People know, you know, when you're on a basketball team or you're on a team, you're out there with five, four other guys or 11 other guys or whatever in the football field. But when you get in that ring, it's you versus the other opponent, mm-hmm. you know. And and then even more than that, it's the training leading up to that that I would always admire. Like the lonely, you know, the work that you put in. I'm always about, I love about that, like the, what it really takes to, to perform. You know what I mean? So kudos you to know, you, dog. You know- Thank you. You know what they say about um, fighters? They say the way you fight in the ring is the way that you walk through your life. Mm. And it's really true. You know, if you have being a fighter, yes, on the outside, you can see like the punches coming or the kicks, whatever you do, you can see it coming. But there's a lot that's going on in the inside, you know, the spirit and the mindset and that spirit and that mindset is something that you need to keep strong throughout your life. Mm. You know, a lot of people who have these like mental illness issues or they have these like anxiety, they have these hangups. It's because they've been mentally defeated over time. Either somebody got an A-head or they defeated themselves. They saw they saw that girl that they wanted to talk to. They never talked to that girl. So over time, they just kept getting weaker. They mm. kept saying they weren't good enough. Or it's like somebody they never spoke up to. They never... Life life break life gives you scars over time unconsciously. You think things don't have a don't play a big impact in your life, but they do, man. You know, and when you play in a sport, you have the opportunity. That's one of the best things about playing sports is that you actually have an opportunity to challenge yourself and to grow. Mm-hmm. And if you're not if you're not playing a sport, I don't see it's it's gonna be very difficult for you to challenge what life comes at you. Mm, I totally agree. And like and like you said, as a young human as a young man especially it's it's imperative it's imperative not it's not important it's imperative that you challenge yourself and you test yourself and you see who you really are and what you're really made out of because like you said if you don't do that then you're going to the rest of your life as you go on you're not going to be able to trust yourself you're not going to be able to respect yourself you're not going to be able to you know like you said do anything in life in in the way that you want to do it you're always going to be on someone else's terms because you don't really trust yourself because you have to challenge yourself and find out what you're made out of. You know what I mean? Mm. So yeah. I love that, man. Um, so after you got to uh, Montana, tell me about your experience at Montana. How was it playing on the team? Because I mean, mm. would you like the star? What was it? Yeah. Was it? So so first of all, no, I wasn't. I came there like I, like I think I told you. I just I was super under recruited. I came in with like no hype. They were actually changed the coach. So it was a new coach starting a new program. And he brought in, you know, like some JUCO guys and a bunch of, you know, recruits. So it was like five, six of us just coming in, just going to change up the program a little bit. And uh, I was a freshman. And uh, first of all, I got I got the culture shock. As soon as, as soon as I got up there, which I thought, 
that I thought I was going to like, I, I found out quickly, like, this is different. This is different than California. This is like, I'm away from my family for the first time, really, like, you know, on your own. Uh, so it was like, that was tough. The beginning, I wanted to go home that, to California right away. <laughs> my roommate, it was, I was so lucky. My roommate was actually from L.A. So we actually bonded. We, we became like lifelong friends because we, we came there and we're like, what is going on? This is a different environment for us. And let's just stick together. But when we first got there, we, he was making calls like to Pepperdine, to, uh, <laughs> to USC down here, talking with their coaches. And he was like, hey, yeah. you know, we get, you got a spot? <laughs> we're ready to come. We're ready to transfer yeah, out right yeah, away. Yeah. But thankfully, I stayed. Man. So the first year, I played as a freshman. I didn't have, I, I had okay success. I was just learning, whatever. And then the second year, I actually hurt my, um, my ankle, which is like, a, I had like a hairline fracture in my foot. And I ended up red shirting. And that was the best thing that could have happened because I, then I had time to get in the weight room and change my mentality, get, you know, prepare myself, uh, you know, to have a, a better career. So when I came back, then I hit the ground running. We uh, went to the championship game on ESPN, uh, had a great season uh, the next year. Then the senior year, yeah, I was, I was a star. Like those, the next three years that I played, I was a star the team, impact player. Uh, you know, like I, I think I, I said something the other day, like, I got into like the thousand point club. I was like the, the strength athlete of the year three times in running, uh, which is like an award for the athlete that exemplifies like, the hard work and dedication stuff. Um, yeah, so I had a great career. Ended up having a great career there. Made lifelong friends. Expanded my mind so much from being in uh, Montana, being in a different like culture, like I said, and uh, you know, just changed my life really. How was it? Um, you talk about the culture as we I mean, as you were talking, it reminded me because I actually contacted you my first year at Utah and um, I was briefly seeing a uh, Swedish woman. Right. And I remember I like, oh, yeah. <laughs> hit you up about that. And I was, briefly <laughs> seeing a Swedish, I was yeah. briefly seeing a Swedish woman. Right. But then I had Googled Montana State and I looked at the environment and like I was trying to see what was going on over there. And I was seeing that like the activities they have outside of the college and whatnot. And from what I can remember is that it was in the middle of nowhere. And I think they had like, ah, oh man, I can't remember. But it was like, I remember it was really green and it had like farmy type of stuff, yeah. like farmy, like fun events that people, that the locals really liked. Yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah. did you do any, did you get any into any of like the cultural <laughs> activities? Like what's the most unique thing you got into while you were there? The most unique. So the summertime is like the probably the most beautiful time in Montana. You know, during the wintertime, it's, it's, they have rough, rough winters, right? Snow, you know, minus 20 and with wind and all that stuff. Black ice, like you said, in Utah. But so the summertime, we would come out there and we had summer school and we'd do summer training. And uh, the summertime, they had these activities called floating, floating on the river. Um, so I had a I had a great opportunity to go on, on the floats. You know, you go with groups, you guys, you get your little drinks and, and have a little fun, go down there and just float the river. And it had like a gallon, it's called the Gallatin River. You float down there, have a good time with people. And then afterwards you go to like a, <laughs> they had like a, a bar, a barn, a uh, bar in the, in a barn. So you would go there and they would have like country, uh, a country little music there. So I kind of got, got it exposed to that. And then actually they had a festival, which was in the, which was in like North Dakota. So that was the thing. A lot of guys would go there. It was like a country music festival that was big. So I got to go get exposed to that life that I had never, ever in my life, you know, seen. So it was pretty cool in that aspect. I remember seeing that water rafting. I yeah. remember seeing that when I looked it up. I remember looking that up. And you, okay, so Montana, have you been to Yellowstone? Uh, you know what? I'm ashamed to say I have not, man. It's, it's crazy. Oh, my goodness. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's that's in Montana, I think. It is. <laughs> it's right up the road, I think, too. But, you know, also, so when I was in college, man, I, I was super focused, like, about my career, about basketball. I knew that I, I really wanted to focus to, on this time. This time was for me to get become a professional basketball player. So, like, my, okay. my friends would tell me, I mean, my, my roommate, who's, like, my best friend and actually lives down here in L.A., um, he he would tell you, like, I was more focused on the basketball side. They would have parties and stuff, and I kind of would, I'll be that guy that would 
stay in stay in the house studying a basketball field, you know, <laughs> or hey, you know what I mean? Believe oh. it or not, believe it or not, I was that guy. Were you that? I guy? was that same guy because a lot of people thought that I was like they would see me. They my nickname was Gangster D. That's what they called me for like the first two years when I was at Utah. <laughs> and so what I used to have my do rag all the time. So I remember I was that. My, yeah. And I was just and I was just serious. Yeah. So, but um. Yeah, man, I was just like, when I was in college, I was the same way. People thought that I was trying to talk talk to a bunch of girls and do all that. But really, I, I was an introvert. I still am. I mean, I am an introvert. Mm-hmm. So I like to just be to myself. And I was, during my, my spare time, I was learning how to code or picking up different skills. And I knew that when I came to Utah, that I was there for football. I knew that I was there for football. I was trying to become a professional athlete at the time. And um, I don't know, I think I just matured in that way sooner than other people did. And yeah. That's what my um that's just where my main focus was. That's awesome. How about just for the people who are listening who are younger athletes, I still talk I live right next to the University of Utah and I still talk to um some guys that are on the team and I'll tell them that, you know, um I try to I, I tell them to have their fun. I don't want to take yeah. take away another athlete's fun or a person's experience. But I also let them know that, you know, um it ain't always gonna be the way that it is right now. And um yeah. You need to develop your social skills. And if you are talking to women, you should actually get to know who you're talking to. You know, you may be focused on playing football at this time, but not all of you are going to go to the league and then you're going to want something different. Your relationships are going to change. It's not just going to be physical. You're going to want to connect with somebody and get to know somebody. You want going to want somebody to get to know you. So could you talk a little bit about your experience with that and how you well, met your, yeah, chose your wife ultimately. Oh yeah, see, so that that actually came later on, and I to, I totally agree with you. Like now, so I, okay, well, let's get into that part later. I, okay. You went out, but let's get to that part later on. Okay. How did you how did you handle that in college? The same part of that part first. How did so, you handle, manage that in college? In college, you know what's crazy is like I kind of knew. I don't know if this was ignorant or whatever. I just I knew like I I knew I wanted to be a professional, right? And I thought I didn't want to have something that was going to kind of hinder anything or at that moment. So I wasn't looking for anything serious. Like I wasn't going to look for, you know, I didn't need like a girlfriend at that time. Right. I was literally yeah. focused so much on the game and stuff. But then when I did go out, I, of course, you know, I, I, I mingled, you know, had my, you know, I would talk to people and stuff. Um, and then, you know, as a result of, of obviously being on a team and having a platform, you're going to get a lot of people that come, that want to be next to you, that want to yes. come talk to you. Come you to so I would, I was always pretty like good with figuring out the ones that were, that had some, like that were value. I say value, like not just some yeah. old, like, you know, girl that's just trying to be, we call it Jersey chasers back then. Like, you know, they just want to mm-hmm. be seen with the team. You know, they want to be next to someone with the, I guess the group they call groupies, you know, so I knew, like, I didn't want to be involved with that. You know, I'm, if I'm going to be with someone, I would make sure that they have value and they added value to me. So in Montana, I didn't I honestly didn't have, uh, like, a steady girlfriend. You know, I just, uh, okay. you know, I just knew who I was dealing with and that they have value. But I knew that, like, I wasn't going to be with them for the long term. So we just created okay. a relationship. Okay, kind of like how it was. There not I want to want to add to it. When I was playing ball, I was the same way. I was like, I think I was too immature, or like I just wasn't focused on that. But um, there were definitely women who were the jerseys chasers, and there were women who wanted to get to know me, Mm -hmm. you know. And but I was just I wasn't there, and I knew that them wasting their time on me was a you know was a it was going to be bad for them in the long run, Mm -hmm. you know. So I I pretty much I, I tried to be as honest as I could be, and. If I saw a woman who was going there with me, I would let them know, like, hey, you know, I'm not about that right now. You can go date somebody else or something. Exactly. You know, so I was, I, was fair, I was fair in that regards, you know. Yeah, and that sounds like exactly what the kind of time I was on, you know. I didn't want to waste their time or, or like, give them – I knew I couldn't give them something that – if they were looking for something serious, like, I, I'm not – I'm not at that stage in my life right now. Yeah, right? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But so you knew you knew that you wasn't ready for that, right? At that time, I knew I wasn't. I knew I wasn't ready, and um, and just because of for the people listening, um, there I was also really mindful who I did um share my time with in that way because at University of Utah, these D ones, if a lot of women can be bitter, and if they don't get what they want, mm-hmm. or you know they feel like they were lied to, 
you know, they would a rape case would happen, man. And I saw it happen. And I, you know, I, my cousin was like a really good basketball player growing up that I admired. And um, he didn't make it to the league. And I asked my grandma, I remember asking my grandmother this when I was younger. I was like, why didn't, you know, his name is Keely. I was like, why didn't Keely make it to the league? And she said, because he was involved because of women and he wasn't focused on the studies. So I always had that in the back of my head. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I never really dealt with the women who were at like those team parties or who always, we go to lunch and were always there at lunch because I felt like it was just, um, it was a bad situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I always... I, I, I've always felt comfortable, maybe because we grew up without social media, I've always felt comfortable having a conversation with somebody, meeting somebody, getting to know them that way, and then determine if I should, you know, involve them in my life. <laughs> that's, a smart, that's a smart way to do it. Right there. And that's something that you should yeah. tell is when you talk to these athletes, like you got to tell them it's important, like you said, to have a little social life, but it's even more important to know, to judge, to be the judge of that character who you're dealing with, you know. So don't just yeah. go there because of whatever, looking good, and you just, you know, you're letting your hormones take over actually have a conversation figure it out see what the mind's at you know what i mean yeah. and then uh deal with it accordingly and you need allies anyways man i mean i met some women that you know it, it didn't go that it didn't go that route but we were cool and then you know i'm still cool with them to this day they check on me see how i'm going how i'm doing you know i can fly out to another country get to know their country hang out with other friends from other spots and it's just friends right you feel me so just it's good to just build those social skills you know yeah exactly it's funny man uh, in in our culture, especially like when we were growing up, it was like they kind of like they wanted the athlete to be overly like you're supposed to you're supposed to sweat these you know what I mean like these girls or whatever. But I was always yeah. the opposite. Like I, I figured like respect myself. I know I knew it was gonna come at me. So yeah, you know what I mean. So I, I knew to I would make the choice. You know what I mean? I was I was the same way. I was feeling <laughs> my cousin used to hate that. He'd be like, "Do I think he the Do I think he the uh, he the trophy or he think he the catch?" I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> right." I mean, exactly. When you but when you earn that right to do that, I mean, you're when you make yourself a high value person. That's what it is, mm -hmm. you know. So. Yeah. But I'm so always after about, Montana, I'm always man. Respecting the, the women, at 100 percent over everything. You know what I mean? No, one thousand percent, one thousand. Um, honestly, the men who don't really get women are the ones who disrespect women, at least from my personal experience. You know what I'm saying? Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> they got the most to say. But um, let's talk about your professional career, man. I mean, from from beginning to the end, uh, you started your career in Cyprus. I did. Yeah, believe it or not, did, they actually. How did have, that happen? They have a good league out there, man. Um, so what happened was, so I finished my co my college career, and what, so my senior year, I was uh, I was getting a lot of calls from the university to my university from uh, San Antonio Spurs and Sacramento Kings, and okay. um, it was another team in the East Coast. But my coach was coming in and telling me, "Hey, Spurs just called me about you." King, so I'm like, "Okay, that's that's dope." You know, I'm just my ultimate dream. Um, so I ended my career. Unfortunately, I didn't get any workouts that because you know they have a combine uh, after the college season, yeah. in May leading up yeah. to the draft. I didn't get any get any workouts. Like, okay, then the June draft comes. There was a chance for the late late second round that I was going to get picked. So I was up watching the NBA draft. I'm like, okay, I'm not, you know, second round comes. All right, last pick comes. Okay, didn't get picked. All right, that's understandable. Now what happens is. I'm supposed to have a chance at summer league, the NBA summer league. But when I came out, it was 2011. And right after the draft, like the day after, they go on the NBA strike. <laughs> they say no summer league this year. So there was oh, wow. no NBA summer yeah. league. So what I did was I was like, okay, there's no, NBA shut down. It's not, it's not going on. There's no summer league to, for, you know, where you try out and you can be seen by the NBA scouts to make a team, make a roster. I had an opportunity to join the Swedish national team that, that summer. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to Sweden to play, you know, for the country, which is an honor, you learn European style, you know, make some contacts and, and, and it's a great, uh, you know, career start. Mm -hmm. Went out there, played in tournaments, and then I got this offer from Cyprus. I'm like, I had never heard of Cyprus before. So my agent was like, yeah, you know, this is what happens. You go to Cyprus, you have a good year, and then the other big European countries are going to, you know, they respect this league. So it's like a feeder. So I said, okay. I looked up Cyprus. 
it was an island and I said my team was right on the beach <laughs> I said okay this ain't so bad so <laughs> I went out there man we had a um, I had a great time man. like it was, don't get me wrong it was actually very tough in the beginning because it was my first time living in Europe like away from you know everybody so and you know when you first come out of college you got your friends still that are in college you know you got teammates that's still on the team that playing so I'm over here waking up uh, all by myself and they and they're going to sleep so you know you, the time difference is crazy but um, the league was good man. what language do they peak which language do they I look, honestly i didn't know what cyprus was before this this podcast and i looked man. it up and i'm like man he was in the middle in the middle, middle of nowhere, nowhere island that? man <laughs> well they speak uh they speak greek so it's like a it's like a little bit of it's a greek culture they have one the north part of the island is turkish so it's, it's a greek and turkish uh culture I think I remember hearing about Cyprus in like ancient Greek uh, stories, you know, yeah. um, or like the battles that they used to have with um, the African. Like Greeks used to have battles with the Persians and the Africans, but I, I remember Cyprus being referenced a lot. Yeah, it's kind of the team I played for actually called Apollon, Apollon Limassol. So that's like a Greek um, word, you know, Apollon. And uh, mm. but it was beautiful. Like if. If I wasn't so focused, I would have been on the beach every day because I could have. But I was like, you know, okay. I was focused on trying to make that career and, and get it going. How was the culture? How was the culture in Cyprus? The culture is very Greek. So they're like, I don't know if you, you know much about the Greek culture, but they're just like people who are very, very, very passionate, man. Like passionate people. Like the cars, you, the, the traffic is crazy, man. <laughs> they're like, there's no stop. Like they say, the stop signs optional out there, man. So they just coming and you just got to swerve out the way. It's crazy. <laughs> and actually, the, so it's, uh, it was a, Brit, a British uh, colonial uh, state so that we drive on the other side. So they, the team gives you a car when you play in Europe. They gave me a car and, and the steering wheel was on the other side and the road is on the other side. I'm like, what in the world is going on? First couple of times, I'm on the whole other side of the road, almost getting hit. <laughs> oh, man. But I know they was mad at you. They was, yeah, and, and that's at the you thing. Like, so the Greek people, they go, they come outside the window, they're over there cussing you out they're with their hands and everything. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. <laughs> but was actually, I'll tell you what, the craziest story about so that Cyprus year was, when I tell you about they have uh, the fans, oh, the people have passion. The fans have crazy passion. It's like a soccer, you know, have you ever seen a soccer, European soccer where they have the yeah. players? Yeah. So these people, they would have the drums going, the flares going, and then at certain places they would have like little dynamites of uh, dynamite, like little sticks of dynamite, and they would throw it on the floor and blow it up if, if they're not feeling the uh, the rest of that game. <laughs> they would throw stuff. Oh, <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you a story. So we had this little derby, right? You know, derby was a rivalry game, and we uh-huh. played, and uh, so we were killing this team going into halftime, and we're walking into the tunnel to go into the into the locker room. And you know how they got the tunnel and they got the fans over the tunnel. We're going underneath. So they were cussing at us, going crazy. And one per- and, and I'm walking out with my friend who's a uh, rookie. And one of the, the fans spit, spits on him. So he spits Whoa. on him. And my guy goes crazy. He's like, no, nah, he's trying to go, you know, cussing out right now. And uh-huh. so I grab him like, no, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I'm cussing at him too, but I'm like, let's get up, get, go to the locker room. So I go into the locker room. We're all, you know, trying to trying to wind down going all right all right so i tell everybody all right yo, everybody let's just calm down let's just go out there win and let's go home you know we already beaten these dudes let's win and let's go home and as soon as like i'm trying to calm everybody down we have th- this locker room had windows all of a sudden you hear a window break and then something comes on the floor i seen something come on the floor uh, they threw something into the locker room. i look down it's a grenade I said, what? So I jumped into the, uh, they have, you know, our showers right here. I run, I said, come on, I jump into the shower. And I'm just like embracing. I'm thinking it's a grenade that's about to blow up. I'm like, oh, I'm thinking I'm about to lose my life. Yeah. So I'm just embracing, yeah. just waiting for the explosion. And an explosion goes, but it was a smoke bomb. So it goes, smoke bomb, the locker room uh, goes into green smoke, is uh, filling the whole locker room. So we're like coughing, you know, trying to get out the locker room. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So I go out to the <laughs> locker room, and coming down the uh, the hallway is those crazy fans. They had got past security, and they come in with bandanas on uh, over their face. They had little sticks. And, and oh my! They God. coming down the <laughs> locker room, brother. So, so what happens is it's a free for all at this point. So I, I look, there was, and there was little. Some of them was little dudes. So I, I hit two, two of them. I hit two. Boom, boom, hit one. 
And then I had a Gatorade cooler right next to me. Threw the Gatorade at, at the other people, and then I noticed we outnumbered. So as soon as I hit the both of them and threw that Gatorade, I started trying to find the exit. <laughs> so I started running mm-hmm. and uh, looking for the exit outside of, to leave the arena. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is not safe. So they over there fighting, throwing rocks, and, I, and, and everybody just trying to run away. So I, I go down the hallway trying to look for the exit of the arena. All of a sudden, I get pulled into a room. I get pulled into this room. I'm like, oh, what's going on? I'm getting ready to fight. They're like, nah, nah, put this, put this uh, green warm-up on. The other team was green. And who's this? Who, who, it's who's the this other team. Is? They in the closet. <laughs> they, they saw me running. They pulled me oh. in. They pulled me in and put, they said, put, their, put our warm-up on. You're with us. They closed the door. So I'm in this little closet, you know, whatever it was, storage room. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, this is, uh, our fans are crazy. I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, let me let me go out to my, they're like, no, 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 you can't go out, you can't go. So we had to stay there for like an hour and a half until the police cleared everything out. And that was probably oh, the craziest man. experience I ever had, man. And I'm coming from straight It's crazy, but it's a, it's a crazy, but it's a good experience now that you hear yeah. it, you say yeah, exactly. it. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, that was a that was a wild experience, and then that that encapsulates the passion that they have in in Cyprus. Yeah, they passionate people. Okay. And then after that, you went to Italy. Yeah. So then after that, um, and you were in Italy for a number of years, right? Yeah, that's my spot, man. So after that, I had a good year. Uh, you know, we went to the, the our finals, conference finals, and then that year, the Serie A team Varese signed me to a multi year deal. And that was perfect, man. They brought me to the first league. I uh, came there, and that was a whole nother level. When I got there, this was we talking about professional, like you know, everything was first class. Everything was the top, top notch, and and okay. it was a whole different, a different culture. They, they're super passionate fans, but in a different level, you know, I mean, different. Obviously, you know, more, more safe in, in that way, way more professional. Uh-huh. And uh, I just, I love it there. I made my name. So the first year I won the, the regular season championship. So we were, were the first in the standings. And then we had a great year. And that team was like a historic European team because in the past they played in the EuroLeague. So I made my, my name for myself in Italy there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, just stayed there for the next year. Um, then we had a bad year. And then I had to kind of re- reintroduce myself again. So this team down in Reggio Calabria signed me in the A2. So that's when I kind of really got my career going to a different level because, I, I, like I said, I had to re, I had to uh, go back into the drawing board and make, and I wanted to, to make a, you know, a bigger name, a bigger mark for my game. So that summer is when I really started locking in. When I stay, I, I put everything away. I was up five in the morning. I was uh, doing three workouts a day at that point. Was in the track. That's when I like really took things to another level. And this team in Reggio Calabria signed me, and I had a great year there. And, and then my name was hot in Italy, and I stayed for those years. Okay, um, where? Okay, so I'm looking at your resume. Where was this at? Was this Southern Italy? Southern Italy, Italy, yeah, that's right. You know, this is actually the team. Okay. Uh, it's funny. I lived in. Uh, this is a team where Re- uh, Kobe Bryant's dad, Joe Jellybean, played for. He played in Reggio. Oh. And then what happened was that's where Kobe grew up where, for a second. Right? Yeah, so he was there for a year. Then he went to another place, but this, so, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, but when you sign with in these levels, you know, good level of European teams, they give you in the contract, they give you the house, they give you the car, they give you whatever else, you know, on top of the, the money you signed for. So Reggio has a, a whole apartment complex for their own, their own team. They own this whole like complex, like a uh, gated community. So when I got there, they, get, they said, hey, this is your, your apartment up here. You know, everything's set up. I went up there, and then they were like, uh, do you know whose apartment you're living in? I was like, no, nah, whose apartment? They were like, this was Kobe Bryant. Uh, this is where he where he stayed when he was here. Like, this was his dad. Was, they were living in this very apartment. So it's kind of like the, the thing of pride for that team. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that was dope, man, just having that experience, too. Did you learn any Italian while you were there? I did. I, I did. You know, it's crazy in Southern, in Italy in general, they don't speak so much, you know, English in a lot of places. Yeah. And then in the South is even more so. Uh, so I was like having to learn little bits and pieces of how to say, you know, this is when I started going out in, into the culture and like really into the town and, and meeting people from there and going to the restaurants. And, mm. and one thing I'll say, I always tell, so the first two years I was in the North of Italy, 
in, in the north was Milano. Milano, yeah. Were you Milano? Right next to Milano. Okay. Yeah. So it, up there, everything is super nice, modern and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. But the people are more, you know, and it's a colder climate. So the people are more, you know, reserved. But then when I went to Reggio, it's right there by Sicily. Literally, it's outside of my apartment, uh, my kitchen window was Sicily. I could see the island right there. But it's hot. It's always sunny. And the people are super different. They're like, uh, first of all, it's not modern down there. It's like, looks a little bit like a uh, little, like ruined kind of, you know, houses. Okay. Yeah, they're not all the way built. Some of them. <laughs> anyway, the, but the people are so much more passionate there and open. So when I got there, they were like, then I was the star of the team. And they were like, man, I, you, I was going to a restaurant. They come in, oh, Eric, they clapping when I walk in. They clap, <laughs> they clapping. <laughs> and I'm having a meal, right? I'm having this full course meal. Of, of everything they bring out pasta chicken salad uh, roasted potatoes wine 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 and i go to leave to pay and they were what no 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 you go 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 you don't pay here you don't pay here so yeah. it was like that man and then people was inviting me over to their place and wanted me to be a part of the, the families and, and meet mm-hmm. and go to you know birthday parties and be and show up there and do that stuff so that was awesome experience. Italy, Italy's cool, man. Uh, Have you been? The, cause my one of my my best friend is Italian. He he's from Milano. Okay. So I went to I went to Milano to go visit him, right? Okay. And I rem- the only word I remember in Italy is figa. That's what he would say. Figa. <laughs> you would you would know that. You would know that word. <laughs> I don't even remember what it is. Oh man, I don't know what it's it is. Like, uh, I mean, it's like in the, in a nice way, it's like a beautiful girl. It could be like that. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's, yeah. That's but it can also be vulgar too. But yeah, so oh, I remember him saying all the time in college, and I can, I don't remember. I mean, after we graduated, he went back. I forgot what it meant, mm-hmm. but I remember that word, <laughs> figa. <laughs> yeah, and that's fun. And that's another thing. So as soon as you're an American or an imported player, you go there, you're amongst the Italian players and they're on the team. So the first thing they want to do is they want to teach you them words. They want. You know, Hey, go go tell her. Go tell her figure. Go go tell. Her. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny, man. Oh man. Hey, I was in. Uh, I was in. Italy. I was in Milano, right? And I, honestly, I drove from. Um, I was in. I was on the border of Germany and Austria, so I was in like Berghausen, and I drove from there to uh, Milano, right? And then uh, I remember I went to a gas station. And uh, right when I got into uh, Italy, I got into his gas station and I saw this Italian guy that was blacker than me. And I was like, whoa, like I could tell he wasn't black, African, African, African American, but like, I can tell he was a black dude, but he was Italian, oh, right? Whoa, and I was wow. like, what the hell? <laughs> so I went, so I went, so after I got to my boy house, so before I got to his spot, the Italians drive wild out there. Like people was cussing each other out. Yep. I saw people driving on the, the train tracks and then I didn't know what I was doing. That sounds <laughs> I didn't know what right. I was doing. And then, and this woman was like cussing me out. This old woman, she got out of her car and walked over to my my window and she realized I wasn't Italian. And she was like, oh, and then she got nice and was trying to help me yeah, yeah. figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> but I told my boy, I was like, man, you got to drive the whole time. I said, you, you take over now, man. <laughs> That's it. But, uh, it was cool, man. I'll post some of my, uh, I, well, I had pictures of it at first. I still had the pictures and I had videos. I took it down because um, I was getting like a lot of hate and I didn't understand the hate because I was just visiting a friend from college, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize like the people that I grew up with, they don't care about traveling. You know, going oh, yeah. to Disneyland is a good thing, right, right? Right, right? So they were cool. They They were asking me questions like, oh, how's the food? How's this? But there was a lot of middle class kids I went to uh, college with that was hating it, and I didn't realize like certain classes of people value certain things. So certain, so for some people going to Italy and traveling and visiting, that's like there, that's what they value in that that class. Yeah. So I was getting hate from people that didn't even know me or was from like a whole different environment that that's I didn't grow crazy. up from. So I was like, what, what were they saying? What kind of what yeah? Kind so of hate? there was just like man, like um. Oh, you think? Oh, man, I had somebody run up on me one time, somebody that I knew that I was cool with. And then he was like, Oh, you think you're rich now? You think you're rich? And he was dead serious. He was dead serious. And I was like, It threw me off. I was like, What? And then he was like, uh, And then I got him to calm down. We was talking about something else. But I had that. And then I had girls that was like, You know, you meet women that 
will entertain you and you get women who won't entertain you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So there were some women that would like play hard to get. But then once I went on my trip, they would they wouldn't even talk to me. They'd look at me like with their nose up and then just, you know, That's they crazy. stopped messing with me. And I and I actually lost two good friends. Well, they the guy that I thought was my good friend. I lost a good friend because I was traveling and doing things just got jealous. That is but, crazy. Um, well I'll tell you it, what, that's a blessing, man. If you lose those people. It is a blessing. It is a blessing. It took me ten my friend was trying to get me to visit him for like ten years, but I was so focused on my professional career, making it to the league, and then I got focused on just finishing school and figuring out my life. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That I didn't make time to go travel and visit. No, well, but anyways, well, you, when I was there, finish that. Go ahead. I was gonna ask, yeah, about so did you learn what did you learn about yourself and about you know the world when you when you traveled out there? Did you learn anything or did you see things differently? When I traveled to um Italy? Yeah, or just, or just Europe in, in general? general. Like when you went out, yeah. Well, I'll focus on the, the I'll focus on that trip. You know, when I when I went out there, um, put it like this, man, I had to put it all together with all the places I went to. Um, when you have a contrast between cultures, you can see the things that you like about American culture, the things you don't like about American culture. Mm-hmm. And um, for example, in Italy, what I saw was more the family aspect. My friend, he was living in his house. He was like the fourth generation in his house. You know, somebody that's coming from America who doesn't, that's my age and doesn't own a property, they would see it as, oh, this person must be rich or whatever. But really what it is, is that in Italy, the family stays so close and they stay within those neighborhoods for a long period of time. Like my friend told me, he's like, you can tell where somebody is from based off their last name. Mm. You know, I had, you know, I would, it, so he could tell which region they were from, but his family, they grew up in these houses and they were downtown and, you know, they grew up in Milano and they've been there for generations. Mm-hmm. But one thing I also got, I, I happened to come during two birthday, two birthdays. So I went to the two, both nights I was there, I was there for Italian birthdays, oh, right? Yeah. And an that event. was like, <laughs> yeah, and that was, uh, it was beautiful, man. I haven't seen nothing like that in America in a long time. I haven't seen people be so warm to each other. And then just be drinking and playing the guitar and singing. Everybody was singing the whole time, yeah. was singing and just like holding each other and going crazy. Right. That was that was really cool, man. Um, God, what else? The first thing I wanted to do, I remember one. I was like, man, I want to try some pizza. And he was like, I was like, I have to try Italian pizza. I was like, if we have in America, I was like, I need to try some pizza. He's like, all right. So we went to this pizza spot and. What amazed me about this pizza spot, and this is in Milano, it um, it had like all these R and B soul artists around the entire mm-hmm. wall. Just pictures of all these like Barry, Barry White. It had like um, Teddy Pendergrass. It had like uh, the Temptations. It had um, Shaka Khan, Aretha. Fr- it was just it was filled. So they 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 see it. They saw they had like people in America. Like the black people that I mean a lot of the young ones, they lose that sense of that culture. But over there, they like it's not just liking the music, they like the culture. Celebrate, so yeah. the guy that yeah, so that guy that had this pizza spot, he lived in America for a short period of time and he loved R and B music so much that he created a pizza parlor with, with these old R and B artists. That's awesome, <laughs> yeah. man. And, that, and that's exactly right. Yeah. They really and people don't in America don't understand like in Italy, they have a, a long history of like we have artists that go there that have toured and they've embraced that culture. And then like the athletes, it's like so the reason why they have great leagues is because they they have a history of bringing NBA people there and stuff. And then once they 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 got a hold of that there, they love the culture. They wanted more of it and they celebrated it. And it, you know, they love exactly it. exactly man. That's awesome, man. It, and I mentioned too that I saw this Italian guy that was darker than me. So I mentioned, I told my boy, I was like, "Hey, man, uh, I was like, I went to this gas station, and it was this Italian guy that was like, he was black. Like I can tell he was Italian, but he was way darker than me." And he said, "Oh, he started laughing." He said, "Well, basically, give me a history lesson." He said, "Italy is really close to Africa," and he says, "The southern," he said, "The usually," he said. For thousands of years, the Italians and those Africans were mixing, mm-hmm. uh, specifically in southern Italy, because of like the wars and people would trade and all that stuff. So he said, 
like 2000 years ago or further, a lot of Italians were a lot darker mm -hmm. during that time. Yep. And I had no idea because we don't talk about that. Exactly. You know? you so I was like, like, oh, OK. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I was saying. So like you, I can yeah. tell. So like you said, what you're talking about is people from the south and where I played in Reggio, which is right next to Sicily. And those people, they look totally different than the people in the north, like totally. In the north, actually, if you go to Venice, mm -hmm. Venice area, you know, they'll have blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, Italian. If you go towards Milan, you know, they're, you know, you know, brown, brunette. But down in the south, they got the black hair that they're, they're really tan, like you said, the dark. Uh, they just look more, almost, uh, they have darker features, kind of look almost more Greek yeah. a little bit. But it's so interesting, man. It's crazy. Greek. They look, they look like that. So Greek. Yeah. It's crazy because in America, um, they talk about, they make Greeks look blonde hair and blue eyes. Really? In America, on our TV, on our movies, like we Troy, the movie Troy, I think Brad oh, Pitt was yeah. playing oh, man, in Troy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Hollywood, man. They had uh, Elizabeth Taylor playing Cleopatra. <laughs> And that's a, and that's another point that I wanted to add. You said, "What is the difference I get from traveling?" Is that you realize that your idea of what people is is different when you travel. Mm -hmm. When I went to when I went to the Middle East, I was in Qatar, and um, there was some Indian people there, right? But they had blue eyes and fair skin, and I was like, you can tell they were you can tell they were Indian, but they just look different. But the Indians that come here, they you mean they're darker. They come from a different region, and then basically when I was in um, just going overseas, you let you know that I want to say no no race of people, no culture or nationality owns a skin tone. Mm. You know what I'm saying? In America, you think it's just a black and white. Right. But if you go to Japan, there's certain parts of Japan where there are people that are my complexion, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, so it's just kind of like it, it, it opened my eyes to yeah. basically it let me know that my idea of reality isn't actually reality. Mm, exactly. Or, you or your idea of what they telling you or what they told you about you know and that's what happened yes. with malcolm x actually yeah that's literally what happened malcolm x when he was with the um uh with the black muslims and then he went overseas and went to egypt and then he said, literally said like hey i've seen i just saw blonde hair blue-eyed muslim like this is crazy so it opened up his eyes like we're not we're not just uh us over here you know what i mean it's a bigger thing so he kind of changed he actually started changing his uh stance a little bit and his views Right up until his assassination. So traveling is that because we're so man. isolated, man. Traveling is that powerful. Yes, you know. Yes, it it definitely. Um, we're talking about people and culture so much more right now. Um, what I want to say in America, man, it's like we have more of an individual mindset we don't have a collective mindset we're not focused on the union or the family we're focused on the individual mm -hmm. and i know for me as a um one of my goals outside of sports was also to have like that family structure that more that union the more um just yeah more than just like that big family thing but i could see that it's it, it goes down a lot more each generation like that's starting to go away we're more focused mm -hmm. on the finances monetary uh Monetary finance, we're focused on superficial things and we're not, we're losing that family unit. And that's something I really saw in these other cultures that it just kind of, um, it made me appreciate a lot more. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you say that because that's literally, so my fiance is, uh, is Italian. <laughs> so literally what, um, what I learned from there, from the Italian, being in Italy was, uh, was just that, like I knew, I saw the, the way the family dynamics was. It was something that, that I admired, like I said, oh, that's something that's great that I I want to put into and bring into myself, you know. My friend, um, his mother and his father had divorced when he was five years old. But if you would have walked into his house, you would have never knew that because his house had pictures of his father and his mother everywhere. And and you know, um, also I went there with another friend of mine, a female from Germany, and then she was like, she was asking about, it. she's like, oh, you know. It uh, Luca's uh that's my friend name his name's Luca mm -hmm. so she was like uh, Luca's his parents he's like she was talking about his father and I was like yeah they haven't been together they divorced like what and she says usually you don't see that when parents separate there's usually a lot more bitterness exactly. and the parents try to like you know they try to remove the other parent but over there regardless if they together or not they still keep that family yeah. like the togetherness it's part so you know, they, they don't they don't never break exactly. that it's so ingrained in the culture it's like 
it would be weird if they didn't. <laughs> it's like it's literally like that, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I loved it. Exactly, man. So you were in Italy for well, based off your resume, you went from Italy to Mexico to Italy, right? Mm-hmm. Well, no. So the uh, I, I went to Mexico, but that was just last last year. So I had been in Italy. So when I uh, after I went to Varese, I went to I was in Varese two years. I went to Reggio Calabria. And then I signed with this team in Ferrara. So I stayed in Italy and I had a, another great year there and, and made um, amazing, uh, you know, memories and everything. And then I... So you, you met your wife in Italy? Um, actually, no. It's funny, man. So I met her, I met her out here in LA. <laughs> but she's okay. from Italy. So I've, I've been, I was playing in Italy. She, uh, she went to school in the States, uh, university, played basketball there. And then she was in LA working. So she was doing, um, getting her, getting her career going here. And, you know, I lived here in the summer, summertime. Um, and we had known of each other because she played basketball also in Italy before she left. So she knew about me. I knew about her and stuff. She went. And then, uh, when I got here, I was like, Oh, I, I saw that she was in town. I saw I hit her up with the message, you know, I said, Hey, Oh, you know, you in LA, I'm, I'm back in town for the summer, you know, let's meet up sometime, you know, connect. So. Finally, I met up with her out here, and it was like the really the first time that we actually connected, like you know, had some time together face to face, one on one. So yes, and and then it was just um, getting to know her, getting to know her. But then I had to go back to Italy. So right before we can really start something crazy serious, I had to go back. So I went back to this, uh, this city in the south, and uh, she was out here in LA, and then came back, but she was in the north. So we were trying to do this, you know, distance relationship for a little while. I see. And then, see. It, you know, and then that summer we had, uh, we were both back in LA again and it was the craziest thing in the world. So the, the team called me and they said, uh, our team is for Lee and we want to, uh, we want to, we want to sign you, you know, it gave us, gave me a good contract and everything. And I, and I, she was with me and I said, you know, I said, this team for Lee wants to sign. Me. She was like, she said, for Lee? That team is literally 20 minutes away from my house in, in Italy. She was like, oh, okay. that's crazy. So it was like a coincidence. Mm-hmm. So I ended up signing to the team there that was 20 minutes away from her family house. So she came back to Italy to finish her, her law degree in, in Bologna. She had like one more year, uh, one semester left, so she had to come back. So it worked out perfectly where we were able to uh, be next to her family home, be together and build like that. You can get yeah. to- you can get to really know her because you get to know her exactly. family. So what ended what you ended know? up being happening was crazy. So I ended up being in this team for three years, and uh, she had to come back here to finish her her uh, degree here at UCLA. So she left. She had to leave me again and go to the states while I'm playing in, in Italy, and I'm there with her family. So I would go to her family's house and have dinner, and they would be inviting me oh, over yeah. for you know, hey, go, come yeah. on over after practice, come over, we got dinner for you, have uh, you know little parties or whatever you know they i was more involved with her family than she was <laughs> it was crazy and how was that man how was that usually people go to other cultures they experience people go to other countries they experience the food and the culture but they forget that the culture is also the people within those countries are also experiencing you at the same time oh. at least i got that in korea oh. so how was it like for the parents getting to know you and getting to know like uh i mean they see from what i look for i want to make this i want to say this real, real fast when I was in Italy, there were posters of Will Smith everywhere, right? <laughs> and I was like, why? I was like, why is all these? I was like, I was like why are all these pictures posted of Will Smith? They don't show Will Smith that type of love here. Right, right. So I asked my boy, I was like, man, I said, why do Italians uh, like Will Smith so much? Because I see him everywhere here, man. He's like, oh, you know, we all loved that Will Smith show growing up. And then they started singing it in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. It's so funny you said that. Everything there is dubbed. Is dubbed. It's, so they got. They actually yeah. have an actor who who who's famous for being Will Smith's voice. He's famous in Italy for being oh, Will wow. Smith. <laughs> so it's crazy. Yeah, that, that's unbelievable. But, but for me, so so so, I, so yeah, the yeah. parents. You went out a little bit. You went out. So in case oh, you were saying something, but the yeah. parents, how was it like for them getting to know you? Because the, the idea they have of like African-American man is really positive yes. in Italy, you know what I'm saying? So how was it for them? Like, you know, what did they, how was it for them? Luckily, and thank God, uh, my my fiance's parents are super cultural. They're, they're open-minded. Her mom is actually Venezuelan. Um, 
Okay. Oh, yeah, wow. she's Venezuelan okay. and uh, the dad is Italian, but so she grew up in Venezuela and, and so she's a little, she has an even more open-minded uh, view of the world than most Italians, you know. So they were, and the dad was, had worked in Canada and, and other parts of the world. So they weren't typical, okay. you know, Italian. So they were super open-minded, super yeah. cool. I had dealt with exactly what you're talking about for my career since I got to Europe and especially Italy. Like I understood what it meant to be like, the attraction to be the entertainer to be that person when you're in the room everybody's looking at you like you know oh this is mm -hmm. their experience in you you know what i mean and i understood that but with them they were super cool and like it was never like weird it was just it was like i was just part of the family i became a son so it was like for me it was unbelievable because you got you got to think the 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 common experience for overseas especially players athletes you're all, you're alone you're there you have your team but you know you're away from your family and you, you don't you know you have a feeling that you're an outsider you have a feeling that you're alone you don't have someone you know to really be with outside of your teammate and you can't be with them all the time so when i got that uh, chance to go with them i really felt like i had a second family there and it really helped me out like just mentally just and i literally just felt like a home felt home they were like come over whenever you want this is your house <laughs> like this is your we're family you know so yeah okay it became like that um what was the okay so after your stay in italy you went to sweden why did it take you so long to get to sweden because well, i mean i always assumed i assumed you were in sweden most of your I, career because you're Swedish. right but i actually i actually never played professionally in sweden i still haven't i never okay. went there so what happened was i during those whoa i thought i read that on your yeah, resume no, I played for, international competition yeah sweden. i played for the swedish national team so, th so that's a different thing so yeah, oh. during the year we played for the your you know your professional team, the club team, and then during the summers they would have these you know international competitions. So yeah, oh. so you, I would play for the country of Sweden. I you see. Know so oh okay, yeah, so that was cool. How that was, that? was that? How was that playing in that Sweden? Dope, man. How was that playing in Sweden for their national team? It was team? amazing. It was my so my grandparents. I, I told you earlier when I was growing up here in the states, my mom would send me to Sweden and. Uh, I was during the summer. I'm out there with my grandparents and my family out there living, and and that's all I knew. Like that was actually home for me because when I came here, as I told you, I was moving around. I didn't have like a real home, you know, in the states. I was always moving different. Every time I moved, I got a different school for a couple of years. Got a different neighborhood, and then you know, so that was actually like the only thing that was a solid in my life. So when I got the chance to do that, I was I was so proud and honored because my it was my I was making my grandparents and them you know the whole family was something they were proud. like whoa this is huge yeah. you know somebody from our family is playing yes. for the whole country like and and that was a proud moment man I was on the TV you know he was in you know the news and stuff I saw yeah I watched oh it. yeah so yeah I was watching and, that. and that's cool man so that was awesome and then also being able to play with the players like. So we had some NBA players that uh, that I played with and became friends with and great friends and then, you know, great young players now that are coming up that I got to build relationships with. So it was a blessing. Man. Okay, yeah. cool. And now you're transitioning from your professional career and your, um, like, how was the transition? I saw that you actually did some stuff with EA Sports, I believe. I did, man. What was it? No, NBA 2K. 2K that's right. How that was that? dope, man. So, uh, so what happened was, about a year and a half ago, you know, I was getting, I'm getting older as an athlete, you know, as a player, you get into your thirties, not the same as, you know, you got to adjust a lot of things. But what happened was I had two herniated discs in my back at the end of the season. It mm -hmm. just took me out and I was getting sciatica and, and I, the first time in my oh, life where I had some really bad, you know, injury that, that really affected me. So I had that before. yeah, you had, you, have you had that? I had it when I was 19. Oh goodness. I pulled my hamstring and then pulling my hamstring, I guess it just, all those muscles around my hips got super tight to the point where the nerve from the lower, my lower back all the way to my foot when I would walk, it would just like, yep. it shocked me. And it took me like a year exactly. and a half to get yep. over that. See, and that's what I'm, yeah. so that's what happened with me. That happened. And then I was towards it. Obviously I had gone through the prime of my career. So I was lucky in that sense, but it, it's even harder as an older athlete when that happens. So it was taking me a long, I knew it was going to be like a long time, like an hour, uh, uh, a year and a half, like I said, to really get fully back. So that summer, I didn't take a deal right away because I knew I wasn't all the way back. I had to train. I had to get back. So what happened was I had an opportunity to come, come from EA Sports, this uh, 
producer was, has been hitting me up for years. Like, we want you to come in and be in the game. And dude, so I was like, oh, now is the perfect time. Like, I got some, you know, I got some time. I'm finally home because usually I'm I'm never home in the States in August. I'll, I'll be gone August until July every year. And I'll be home like one couple of weeks in the, in the summertime or whatever. So now I was finally home in September. It was, it was August, September. And I said, this is a great opportunity, man. Let me go try to see what this is about and make some connections for yeah. the next part of my career, you know. So I went up there, man. It was dope. I got the, uh, you got the little suit on. You know the little they get little they have like a motion capture with, with the balls yeah and the stuff. motion caption. What was first was cool yeah. to see in the facility. They showed me you know I got to go see all the technology and stuff, and they had a court with all the monitors. So I did that, and then did like some little acting for the they have like a little uh, you know the scenes in the NBA 2K uh, where the the guys kind of like whatever my player mode or something. So I just did, did a little something stuff for that, and that was awesome, man. It was so cool. This is a great experience. So what they give you? They give you they give you lifetime uh NBA two K yeah. <laughs> video games up. for free. Do you get something like that? Fact, they hit me up like a couple weeks ago. It was like two you know, we're coming out, two K is coming out now. Which what do you want? Do you want a physical copy? Do you want the digital copy? Let us know. Uh and then they're gonna send me some, you know, whenever. They're gonna send it to me and, and, and some products and stuff and just stuff like that. So Right now, you have your consulting business. Like I know, right? I know. Basically, right now, you're in a tr- transitional stage. I'm, I'm in the same. I'm in the same deal. I'm working on my own business, trying to figure out the next, the next stage of life. Right yeah. now, that's what it seems like is you're, yeah. you're at right now as well. Well, yeah. So I'm still right now. I'm still training, and there's and there's still team uh, talks with teams. But right now, they're, they're starting the training camps right now. And what happens is a lot of times vets like me who are old people now, <laughs> we're old in the game is you don't want to go out there and, and run your legs down in, in two a day uh, in, in, in the summer, in the heat with some, with the 18 year old, yeah, 20 year olds yeah. right now. So you sometimes you give it some time and see yeah. what the options are later on in the season. You can come, come on later. Uh, but so that's basically what I'm you know, My agent is still looking and we'll see if it's a good situation. I'll go. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm starting my, I want to start my family here and I'm working on my business, like you said. And, um, what I'm really doing is I, I can't say the specifics, but there's in in the very near future, in the very near future, I'm going to be working with uh, representing players. So that's what I'm working on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool, man. Um, you said that you're getting older and all this stuff, but honestly, as I've gotten older, maybe because football is more demanding on your body, but, uh, I remember that after when I finished playing college ball, like I was, I had, sh- I had shoulder pain, I had back pain, I had knee pain. But then after about a few years of just not playing anything, I felt better than I felt, you know, probably since I was like a kid, mm-hmm. man. So I'm wondering, like, for you, do you think it's a matter of age or just rest? You, you know, know what? You it's, a, it's a matter of both, 100%. So I've heard, I've talked to many uh, retired athletes now who are, who are dunking now and saying, yeah, you know, I feel good. But the problem with basketball, in particular, overseas basketball is, it's a grind, man. It's a mental and physical grind. Whereas we, we literally practice practicing hard six, five days out of the week. You play six and then you get one day off. Then you do that again. If you have the coach, if you have the, you know, it depends on what coach you have. I had tough coaches the last three, three years where it was a grind. Like it's not like in the NBA where you have, you know, a lot of, you know, rest. You got guys resting, not playing games. You got all the best, obviously the best medical attention, stuff like that. Whereas over yeah. there, you, you, medical attention is lacking. The floor is not no bouncy. It's, you know, in the NBA, you got the nice little bouncy joint. Oh. Over there, you might play on some yeah. concrete, man, <laughs> like underneath the court. Like, oh. yeah, it's so it's a lot of, a lot of, it's, it's a grind and it takes a toll on your body. So what happens is as you get older in your 30s, 34, 35, the teams know. They're like, okay, he's not no spring chicken. And then it starts, they try transition you out they got younger guys coming in all, all the time so it's, it's like a matter of that they'll try the young guys first before they bring the, uh, the how was guys. the pay, how was the pay in um europe compare i mean obviously you played in multiple different leagues but you have a good idea how the payment yeah. works in comparison to the nba i'm sure that this information can definitely benefit a, and you play that i mean you've been a stud yeah yeah you, know, you did that international for your, for your country so how was the pay compared to the NBA, man? 
Well, the NBA is number one, number one league in the world, the best league. They have, they, but they're the best run league, I say, out of, out of the major, all the major leagues. So the pay is, it, you can't really compare. But there is uh, some people making more money in Europe than they do in the NBA. Um, so I'll, I'll say this, because I, I do, this is part of what I work, what I do. So I'll tell you this. Um, okay. If you want, there's, so there's a Euro League the competition in Europe that's the highest level. And that's where guys, you'll see guys making millions, right? So you can make uh, the highest paid guys probably like five million a year, right? Um, but and what the thing is, the difference is the European League is that when you get paid, it's, it's net. It's uh, the, the team pays your tax. Uh, the team pays your, your agency. You get um, your housing is paid. You get you get your housing covered. Your all the living all the living expenses. Your TVs, the internet, all that taken in the contract standard. Then you get your car. Uh, you get your car there, and then you get a lot of teams will do like uh, food. You have restaurants that are connected with sponsorships, so you'll have free meals a lot of times. So what ends up happening is you can you end up netting a lot by playing Europe if you can grind it out. You know, you can you don't have so much expenses. You can you can kind of put that in your pocket. What whereas here, let's say a fringe NBA player is making let's make it easy to say he's making one million dollars a year. What happens is you you know, Uncle Sam is gonna come and take half of that. Uh, the agent fee is going to come into play. He's going to get 4.5 percent of that. Then you got to pay for your. You got to find your living. You got to find your, um, you know, your apartments and stuff. So your cars, your living expenses, stuff like that. So it can get. You end up with maybe 300 something, 400 in the, in the end, net, right? Or maybe more, maybe 600, yeah. whatever, whatever it is for for that particular person in particular state. So those fringe players, I would uh, advise them if they're not, if they're right on the fringe and kind of not making the rosters of the NBA, and they can get a deal in in Euroleague or Europe, they have actually a better career there and make more money in the end. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But but there's so yeah. many levels, man. So there's people also in Europe who are making five hundred dollars a month. <laughs> you know, if it goes from five hundred dollars a month, two thousand uh-huh. dollars a month. And then you get to levels of 10,000, 15, 20,000 a month, 30, 40, uh, then to the hundreds. It just depends. Yeah. And also, you mentioned those fringe players, if they go out there, they, it, it also uh, it also helped them grow. You feel me? Being exposed to those different cultures or whatnot, it helped you give you time to think. It, yeah. I'm a big uh, proponent, obviously, on that, man, like of your human side. We're all humans, too. Like, I, I, I love seeing people mm-hmm. going out there and growing and and experiencing something new like uh, the culture here of the NBA is, is amazing but also like if you get in you can get in the wrong path or you don't ex- you can't you don't have experience as much as if you go to find the culture in Europe and live it and really live it you can open up your mind to so many possibilities and things um I remember I had a I had a distant cousin man Mark Jackson he played in the league but he also he started out playing in in, uh, in, in Turkey and he had a, he had a good deal in Turkey, and he told me he was like, yeah, the, when I went out there first, the first year, I was homesick like crazy. He was like, I was on the phone, and I probably spent three thousand dollars a month on uh, on just a phone bill. <laughs> I was calling. It was back in the day, like ninety seven. He was like, I'm spending thousands a month just on a phone bill. So the next year, I went back to the same team. I said, man, listen, if this is gonna be my life, I gotta I gotta double down on this, and I gotta experience the culture. So what he did was he was went out he, when he had time after practice, he walked around the city. He went to the shops. He went and saw the museums. He went and saw the, the, whatever that city had to offer. And then he went on top of that. He found those uh, fans and families that wanted to bring him to dinner. They were bringing him to dinner. He would go over there. He would have dinners. He opened himself up to the culture. And he, he was able to have such a different experience and, and it changed him. And he told me that he was like, when you go over there, like make sure if you're going to live this life, don't be cooped up in your apartment, uh, you know, watching whatever or not doing anything. Go outside and live and, and get the culture because otherwise you'll be miserable. You know, it's a miserable existence. So that's what I try mm-hmm. to tell the, the guys now going out there. You got to be where your feet are, right? Because a lot of guys also, when you go out there, you want, you're thinking the NBA, I got to get back or I want to get to the NBA. And it will affect mm-hmm. your career where you're at that day. You, you know, you got to be focused on where you're at and enjoy that. And then the things will come later 
That's good advice. You got to enjoy the experience. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you forget. Yeah, exactly. If you're mining your spirit somewhere else, this is going to make you sick because you're going to be feeling like you're missing yeah, out exactly. on something. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that was something that I tried to do with my career. And it, and I was happy, man, with being able to do that in Europe and, and just experiencing the culture and really becoming part of it and learning. And like I said, now... Okay, so yeah. before we uh, we end it, because we almost had like two oh, hours, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you. I want to ask you, what do you have any last words for any of the athletes that are in your position, and also, um, like your experience with coaches? Mm. I mean, what makes a good person a coach? When do you know that you're in a good situation? Mm, that's a good question. I would say the coaching. You will know, besides X's and O's, you can tell if someone knows about you know the game about how to use use his players, you know, basic stuff you can tell right away. Coverages, um, you say this guy's playing, you know, how's he gonna play this this if this guy's coming off the screen and he's hitting three three threes in a row and he doesn't make an adjustment, he said, like, Okay, this coach is a little bit uh, you know, something's going on here. Um, but other than that, man, I, what I notice is it's the difference between the coach who really cares. Right? It's a lot of the times these coaches it's about if a bad coach is about themselves. They're worried all about themselves. Whereas a good coach is more like a like a fatherly figure. He cares about the team. He cares about the players, the person before. You know, so he takes he has your back in the media when when you have a bad game. Um he he builds a different trust. And right. uh, and coaching is, is important, man. Coaching Coaching in in Europe is different than here as, because you have to also build a different rapport with the players, right? Because in Europe you you might have a player for one one season most of the time they're just coming in and out. Whereas here, you know, you have for the long term four years in colleges and high schools, and then in the NBA for a couple of years. So it's important to build that rapport and relationship. And that's what I notice the most great coaches now is the it's a relationship based. They're having a relationship with their players and they 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 get building that trust. What what about you, man? What have you experienced with the with the football coach? I know it's so different in basketball. Um, as you were talking, man, it was reminding me of some of my experiences with um coaches that I've had in all sports, football and um and boxing. And uh you know, usually what it, this is what I saw when you had somebody that was like a, a bad coach. I'll start there. The coaches that usually turn out not to be that good. In boxing, for example, they usually focus because boxing, you, you're not aware of it. You have teams. When you have a boxing coach, there's usually a collection of different fighters and you have a team. And sometimes those coaches will focus on just one person in that team and then the other guys wouldn't get that attention or they wouldn't get any kind of like fights mm-hmm. or whatnot. And uh, you get the same, you saw the same thing on the football team. You'll get players who were, um, I want to say we, we, we had players that were good players or they're decent players, but the coaches have, for whatever reason, the coaches had like some kind of connection with those certain players and he would let them not show up to practice. He wouldn't let them um, just get away with a lot less than other athletes. And what, from what I saw from those coaches, it also carried that, that attitude carried on in other areas. Mm -hmm. It showed up in our, um, our game plan. We usually were well, we weren't well prepared in our game plan. Um, The coaches would panic in the games rather than, um, yeah, because we had no game plan, when things would go wrong, they kind of didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like there was no no improvement or no growing from any kind of the experiences from game mm-hmm. to game. And uh, what I noticed just being at the University of Utah, when I was at the U, we were in the mount we were in the Mountain West, and we went to Pac twelve my last year. But what I we were we were dominant in the Mountain West. And one thing that I noticed is. Uh, regardless of if somebody was from a, a different state, a different background, different religion. Uh, Cause you, like I said, religion plays a part out here in Utah. If they're from a different religion, we all were a unit. We all hung out together. We all, we partied together. We all were one. There was, we had one identity, mm-hmm. you know, when we were on that team. So because we were so close and the coaches, we, we also were well prepared, man. The coaches there, you know, there were times where, just me looking back and not being aware of what was going on. There were, you know, there were moments where I felt like they were overworking us or I felt like, you know, I didn't understand where things were going. But when I was at the U, we had a really good, we had a good positive environment. Everybody on the team got along with each mm-hmm. other. Even if they didn't get along because we had a culture of a camaraderie and closeness, the people who would be haters, they immediately adapted to the, the group's mindset. That you know what I'm saying? Important. 
So I think, yeah, so my, from, my, from my experience, I would see how good the people on the team get along. Mm. If you have people on the team that are talking back, talking bad about their teammates or they have clicks on the team, that's probably a good sign that there's going to be clicks in upper management, mm-hmm. you know, but, it, and if the team is close, that means that the coach is going to be close and the people above them are going to trust the coaches to do their job, yeah. you know? So th- that's, that's, that's what I would say makes a good, that's what I, that's what I would say makes a good environment for any kind of athlete. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I've seen, I've seen the the good and I've seen that in the bad. <laughs> so I concur, man. You can tell. One before, also, I have one more question I, I forgot to ask you. You said you're living L.A. L.A. is home. You reference L.A. is home mm-hmm. a lot. Um, why why not make Italy home or Sweden home? The reason I asked that for myself, really, I wanted to live overseas and potentially meet somebody because I like the cultures. Yeah. I like I've had great experiences overseas and dealing with people, you know, what I'm saying and the way they handle relationships and family. So why why settle here in America? Man, that's a great question. Um, and it, it's actually so. I say I say this is headquarters. I don't always say it's home, but this is the headquarters where I'm at right now. And my fiance and I, we're really gonna we're trying to make we're building to make life so that we we have a hybrid uh, actually life so that we want to live here for you know majority of the the year, and then we're gonna live in uh, we have some places in in Italy and and we're gonna we can live at for the, like say summer months or for a couple of months out of the year. So I want to do a hybrid because like I told you, like I'm multicultural, they are both are so huge in my life. I have um, family and friends here, but I also have my family and, and friends overseas where I want to keep. So we're trying to work right now to um, to do both. I want to do keep building my business and stuff here and uh, build a life here, but as well be able to, to live there for a couple months out of the year. So the best of both worlds, man. It's funny. That's what I've been thinking of doing as well. I have a headquarters here in Utah. My good friend in Italy, he's like, D, why don't you get you an Italian wife? And I was just like, I didn't take him serious. But ever since I was thinking about flying, I was like, man, I should go get me. Hey. <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, I, I, I never, when I was there, man, I met a lot of women there. But my mind wasn't even on that when I was there to, be, to keep it right, 100. Right. It wasn't. I was just happy to see my friend and catch up with people from school. Yeah. The thing but, is, um, though, you know. Yeah. From everybody here tells me, especially you know, I'm out here talking to people in LA, they're like, "Man, the dating pool here, the dating culture here, the dating is so tough. It's so difficult here because, especially in LA, I guess you know what I mean. <laughs> like, I can't meet anybody who's genuine and Go stuff ahead. like that. Whereas I found, I'm not gonna knock, of course, American women. I love everybody, but just in my experience, I'm just I noticed there was, uh, it was more genuine interactions that I had in Europe with the women and. And obviously the, the woman that I found was just, it was a connection yes. and a trust and the authenticity that I felt right away. Like, you know, it's, it's missing from our culture. It's kind of exactly. went away. Cause when we first were in, co- when we first were in college, I was, I, I mean, I, I, there's young men that I mentor and I, and they'll tell me these types of things and I'll tell them like, man, you know, when I was in school, like, yeah, people were shy. Some people were better with women than others. And I have friends outside the team. And, you know, some people were shy and some weren't. But you understood that if you were going to meet people, you had to learn how to socialize. And women were also more aggressive. They would be more talkative or they would try. They were they were trying to step out of their comfort zone. But um, ever since social media has blown up and the culture has basically taught men and women to be um, competitors with each other, mm-hmm. like that, that dialogue has went away over this last decade it's kind of um people everybody's afraid there's a lack of mature maturation on both sides and then everybody is just like they're so skeptical i've met i've met women who were into me you can tell they're obviously into me i know when a woman's into me but then they were like there'll be a pause like there'll be like a little anxiety be something Mm. in their head and the men have it too the men are aren't aware of it but they're also had these mental hang-ups going on as well man and i think it's just it's it's something in our culture that's preventing us from actually uh getting past those insecurities and actually being open mm-hmm. and honest and trying to get to know somebody mm-hmm. we're so, we're so focused on the look and uh sex and we forget that in order to have a relationship you have to relate to people there's a deeper spiritual connection yep. and i've had the same thing with women from overseas i was um 
I've had this experience with a Korean woman and I've had this experience with um, European women as well. Even when I would hit on them or talk to them, they would give me the number or whatever, but it didn't go down the same way it would go down in America. They actually tried to get to know me. They introduced me to their friends like, oh, you need to meet my friend. And they wouldn't put me, involve me in the group. And then I thought I was just going to kick it like in America, but they did things way differently. They actually, they, they opened their life up to me. And then basically took they they created they create they created the environment for us to get to know each other. Yeah. In America, that's that's what's missing. Yeah. You know, that's it's a different culture, man. It's you hit it right on the head too. Like it, the the way they go about it, it's totally different. The way they think about the relationship is different. Like so, um, so I had, honestly haven't been date, in a dating pool in America. Has been I've been I've been away so long, so I couldn't really speak on it too much. Good. You know how it is. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, you know, I'm, 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 I just I'm blessed that I was able to find someone that you know that was that, that it was a, you know it was to to compliment me and and we both got the same mindsets and same type of goals you know which is important and also the communication is the biggest thing for me like you know like now like you said people are worried about how they look about this and that they think about short term stuff but if you're gonna have a lifelong partnership. During those phases, those are important, the traction, the connection. But then after that is the communication. It's like speaking about what does it look like if we're going to go further? What's it going to look like when we have kids? What does the financials look like? What are we going to, what are we, what are your goals? What are we trying to do here? Because if someone is like, hey, I'm cool with just being or whatever I'm doing right now. And the other person is like, no, I need to be, I'm an ambitious person or yeah, I'm trying to do this. And you're not on the same page, and they, that can create a rift as well. So there's so many different dynamics, but communication and getting on the same page is so important man, for life. Yeah, you're right. Because after the the physical aspect goes apart and the excitement leaves a relationship, this is somebody that you have to really be a friend with. You know, somebody you have to like this person. You have to be able to talk and kick it and hang out with this person because you're gonna be busy doing your own thing and those types of butterflies won't be there. But as long as you guys are cool and you communicate, you always have that, that connection. It, do, it doesn't exactly. go away. Exactly. Yep. Hey, we going to end man. it with that, man, because that was pretty dope. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, man. That was, a, that was a dope talk. Oh, perfect time, man. There she is. Perfect time hey. to end it. <laughs> hey, how you doing? This is, uh, this is my fiance, and this, this is uh, D. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. You, uh, I have the microphone. It's, but, yeah, so it, it's perfect time to, to close it because we got to head out to go to the beach, man. She's, she's ready to go. <laughs> oh, hey, well, let's stay let's stay in touch, man. Um, You know, life goes all the time, but I, let's Absolutely. stay in touch. You know, I'm always doing things, so I'll yeah, get at you, sure, right? Yeah, You know, I'm always available, man. You will make it work. So this was dope, man. I appreciate right, you having definitely. me on, dog. And hopefully, hopefully yeah, we'll catch for... up in person too soon, man. You went oh, out, I, man. What did you say I the said, last hopefully part? Hopefully, we'll catch up in person soon, too. If you come out here, you know what nah, I mean? No, no, no. We'll, I'll make it yeah. happen, man. All Stay right, up. Bro. All right. Peace. Have a good one. Peace. Peace.